Welcome to the October 12, 2021, 6.30 p.m. City Council meeting. We do have a quorum, so I'll call this meeting to order. Would you please join me in a moment of silence? And the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, would you please read the rules to speak? Yes. Individuals wishing to speak on public and non-public hearing agenda items must complete a sign-up card prior to the item being introduced. Those wishing to speak on quasi-judicial public hearings must complete a sign-up card and sign the oath. Sign-up and oath cards are available on the table in the chamber. Individuals wishing to speak on non-agenda items may do so under petitions from the public present. This opportunity is offered twice in the meeting and individuals may speak at either the first or second petitions, but not both. No sign-up card is required. Citizens shall not comment on any issue more than once during the meeting. All comments except petitions and requests must address the pending issue, and citizens will be given three minutes to speak on all items. Citizens wishing to speak on the consent agenda must su submit a comment card identifying the items of interest. Speakers shall be given three minutes per item. However, citizens wishing to speak on more than three items shall be limited to speaking for a total of 10 minutes regardless of the number of items identified. All sign-up cards and exhibits being submitted to City Council shall be placed in the box on the table in the Council Chamber. Thank you, City Clerk. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the 6.30, September 14, 2021, regular City Council meeting? So moved. I have a motion from the Vice Mayor and a second from Member Jordan. Roll call vote. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. City Manager, special recognitions and presentations. Yes, sir. We're on to uh, item 5A. Um, the mayor will present a letter of support and certificates of appreciation to the participants of the Best Buddies program at Titusville High School. At this time, Ms. Coachman, uh, if you want to come up with a couple of your representatives, and we'll go from there if a couple of representatives are going to come up with you. Uh, while they're coming up, let me just say that um, I'm very familiar with and been very involved with the best buddies of Titusville High School, and um, my hat's off to all the best buddies. This is an opportunity to pair up with some of our ESE students who um, just love them and love having them there, and uh, they make their day. I was fortunate to go over there last Friday and participate in, in, in an event, and um, it's just a, a relationship that... Um, the kids, both sides, benefit from greatly. And I, all my years at Titusville High School, of course, we didn't always have best buddies, but uh, it's always been a real favorite place of mine to go to Miss Coachman's room and uh, Mr. Coachman's room, for that matter, and the ESE rooms and interact and see the best buddies come in and interact. So do all of the best buddies. And I know we don't have them all here today. We have representative group here. But I thank you for what you do. And I know that not only do the kids who you, you bless, thank you, but the parents and the families of those kids, thank you. So I appreciate it. Ms. Coachman, I thank you. So go ahead and start. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Kimberly. Closer. Come a little closer. There Sorry. you go. Um, my name is Kimberly Coachman. I'm a teacher at Titusville High School. I've been a sponsor of Best Buddies since 2014 when we started. And uh, it's an amazing program. Um, we're linked with the Central Florida office. And I brought my... Um, some of my officers here to tell you about the club and uh, some of our agenda and things that we try to accomplish in the community. Good. Come up and tell us your name so we get to know who you are. I'm Chloe Gerwig. I'm Daniela Spamos Rivera. Okay, so. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm president of the Titusville High School Best Buddies Club and basically Best Buddies is an international organization dedicated to establishing a global volunteer movement that creates opportunities for one-to-one -one friendships, leadership development, inclusive living, and integrated employment for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It was founded in 1989 by Anthony Kennedy Shriver, and Best Buddies is a vibrant international organization that engages participants in each of the 50 states and in 56 countries around the world, positively impacting 1.2 million individuals with and without disabilities worldwide. So Best Buddies at Titusville High School 
provides one-to-one -one friendships, supporting inclusion within our school, as well as providing opportunities to share information about our best buddies to encourage inclusion within the Titusville community. As a club last year, we were able to further friendships of intellectual and developmental dis developmentally disabled students while in high school by increasing our membership to over 100 individuals. We organized several Best Buddies inclusion events on, am on campus, brought awareness to innocent lives lost during the pandemic, and attend a state leadership conference, as well as organized several activities for one-to-one -one friendships at Titusville High School. In, in fact, we are in we were influential in helping to start a Brevard County Citizens Program for individuals with IDD because of our success and influence with the Best Buddies Central Florida. As an, important, as an important influential club serving a large population of young people with IDD, we are excited for the City Council to join us in the national movement to declare October as Disability Employment Awareness Month and also dedicate the first Friday in, the, first Friday in March as Best Buddies Day for City of Titusville. Employment is a national issue facing every city and state. Later in the month, you will hear from one of our club founders and a global disability advocate, Delana Parrish. She will share even more insight into the tremendous impact that inclusion employment brings to communities like ours. Now I would like to introduce Danielis Ramos Rivera, our vice president, to give you more informed perspective of what it is like for individuals with IDD and their family members. Good evening. Our Best Buddies organization is dedicated to ending the social, physical, and economic isolation of the 200 million people with intellectual and development disabilities. Our program empowers the special abilities of people with IDD by helping them form meaningful friendships with their peers, secure successful jobs, live independently, improving public speaking, self-advocacy, communication skills, and feel valued by society. I want to use my little brother as my example this evening. He has been diagnosed with a couple of conditions. He's shy, respectful, a loving brother and son. He always wants to have a good, um, good grades because he wants one day to have his dream job, his dream career. In my family, we encourage him every day to continue going forward and not let insignificant things stop him from obtaining what he desires. I would like to keep promoting inclusion for everyone because I want my brother to always be included, respected, and valued by society because he is special. All of our bodies are special. Everyone is special. Thank you on behalf of THS Best Bodies Club. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Coachman, you want to add anything to that? Um, I would just like to go ahead and have my other members introduce Okay, them. I'll be right there. I just want to thank you guys, and, and, and again, I've been there, and I've seen it in action. I've seen what it does. I've seen what a difference it makes in their lives, but it's all, I've also seen what a difference it makes in your lives. So thank you for being the bridge you are for them and everything they need. And Ms. Coachman, again, you and the whole ESE staff and anybody who works with ESE, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So she's got a lot of participants, and instead of trying to figure out who's who, we're going to let her do this at their ceremony. And in the end, I just want to thank you. And if I can shake your hand, that'd be awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to do a picture. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do a picture. That way over there. Okay. You guys go over here. There we go. Perfect. I'm sorry. Guys, again, thank, thank you, very you very much. much. Thank you. I was going to say, just to make it very clear, you've done your part and you don't have to stay for the rest. <laughs> thank you again. 
We'll wait just one second here. All right, city manager, boards and commissions, please. Yeah, yes, sir, on to uh, item 6A, which is the, uh, the uh, Board of Adjustment and Appeals semi-annual report is included in your packet and there's no action required. Thank you. Item uh, uh, 6B, the North Brevard Commission on Park and Recs, the North Brevard Commission on Park and Recs semi-annual report is included in your agenda packet and we provided you an updated version as of 5.30 this evening on the dais and no actions required. And thank you on that. On to 6C, the terms of regular members William Schaefer, Robert Barrows, and Jan Corbin expires um, on September 30th, 2021. Member Corbin has expressed her willingness and desire to continue to serve on the North Brevard, Park, uh, North Brevard Library District Board. Um, for a reappointment of two-year term to expire on September 30th, 2023. Mr. Schaefer does not wish to be reappointed at this time. Staff has reached out to Mr. Barrows via email, telephone, and he has not returned any of our calls to contact him to, to see if he wished to be reappointed. In addition, the recording secretary for the North Brevard Library District has advised that she was unable to reach Mr. Barrows to confirm his attendance at meetings. The recording secretary has also advised that no meetings have been held this year due to a lack of quorum. Uh, staff has also ma mailed a letter to Mr. Burroughs in hopes of his response. There are currently no other applications on file for your consideration. So you have one applicant. Is the applicant present? Here. Would you like to speak? I do. Okay, well, come on up to the microphone. Does, um, slow down. Slow down because they can't hear you until you get here. I can talk really loud. Are you? <laughs> My grandchildren will attest. And I put that, that down. I didn't lift it back up, so help me out there. Thank okay. you. So one of the goals has been the last couple of years is the North Brevard Library Board has really kind of needs to make a shift and be redone. But the problem is the board was created by state legislature under a special act in 1969. And yes, I was alive. I was nine years old. Um, but trying to to have this undone, I have the book, I see, and I know how to do this sort of thing, and I have offered to do it, but it's begun to get very complicated. And I think we're gonna maybe need to sit with city attorney because in my opinion, if you read what was done in 1969 and where we stand now, if I were still a federal government employee, I'd know how to fix it. But in this case, I'm not sure the right piece of paper to write to fix it. Right. So we are, I, need, we, I need help and would like to ask, can I get some help? Um, the county is kind of, if y'all know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> All the agreements, it belongs to the county. It's under the county. But the issue is I'm also the treasurer. We have about $6,000 left. We aren't quite sure. We thought we could give it to the friends of the library. But after I read through everything, I'm not sure we can do that. Because it all came as a result of taxing. So you see where we're standing? <laughs> see, I, 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 hear you, I love but it, this look. I, well, I hear you. It, it is a county board, which I'm sure is advised by the county attorney's office, not my they office. They won't give me an opinion. I can't give advice to a county board. They won't give an opinion. I can certainly uh, contact the county attorney's office and talk to them and see what assistance we can get them to provide. Um, we can talk after this because they refuse to do it. All right, here we go. We're going we're to go in another direction. Uh, but first thing we need you to do, because we didn't do that, uh, your name and address. for. The oh, it's Dr. Jan Corbin, 3655 um, Audrey Drive. And with that, Titusville. I simply want to add thank you for being on the board. Thank you for accepting a reappointment. Not everybody accepts a reappointment. And it sounds like you at least have a vision of where we should go. Yeah, I mean, we want to become an advisory board. But if you look at some documentation, we really already are that. So I, I it's agree. like I'm so confused. So with that, is there anything from the council? I see none. 
we thank you. Okay. I got you. Uh, cards, please. No cards. Uh, motion. So moved. I have a motion. I have a motion. Works? Yes, it does. Motion to reappoint. You guys are getting more than so moved than instead of okay. real motions, but no, that's okay. Exactly. Motion to reappoint Dr. Jan Corbin. I have a motion from Vice Mayor. District there you go. And I have a second from Member Jordan. Roll call vote. Member Jordan. Yes. Mayor Diesel. Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson. Yes. Member Stokel. Yes. Member Robinson. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Ms. Corbin, thank you. Thank you very much. Petitions and requests from the public. I am sure there are none. All right. Three minutes. Okay, uh, we got all the handouts. The um, uh, handouts I get to. Uh, uh, okay, we got. Okay, you got that. I'm gonna give you another one. So you don't get that. Uh, all right, start it up. Let's go. To uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Larissa, you can have that maple soda. No, uh, Stan Johnson, eight sixty point Sad Avenue. I just gave you a, a uh, petitions and requests. At the last meeting, it was about uh, uh, Mr. Larice, and I got a response from Mr. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Robinson about how uh, he's 28 years in the military and so forth. And I don't think that excuses him from what's going on with. Uh, uh, and I'm saying this is this this sheet of paper, which which you have in black and white, and describes numerous uh, things. And it's titled here. It says, "Engineering Atrocities." I'm a professional engineer. Licensed with the uh, uh, state of Florida to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people. Uh, and it says, engineering atrocities, nonsense, and burning money continue because Titusville is a city of closed doors, gag orders, no answers to questions. So in this particular thing, as Mr. Robinson was talking about how wonderful Mr. Uh, you know, other things about Mr. Uh, uh, Lloris, about him 28 years in serving the service, which I, I've also had my... Uh, my dad was in the service. I was in the service. I got three uncles in the service. I got uh, a great grandfather who was a wounded and a prisoner of war, and a great uncle who died uh, as a prisoner of war, and a cousin who died in World War II. And, and uh, I got uh, two uh, high school people who died in uh, Vietnam, and a neighbor last year died of Agent Orange. Anyhow. But, uh, but one, two, three, and four on the back of your sheet of paper, it has to do with Mr. Larice. It says here, Mr. Larice, about nonsense, false reporting, and the legal secret discharge of millions of gallons of sewage. That's a big deal. Uh, that's an engineering atrocity. And number two is, is the spraying uh, uh, cars and people with uh, piss and poop. I don't think that's a good idea. So I'd like Mr. Robinson to consider that. I don't think... I don't think you should allow that. You should have turned the fountains off. That's what that's what the sign was. This sign did, didn't didn't have much of an effect because I put the sign up out there, I posted it, and they still didn't turn the signs off, even though uh, I called FDEP and, and the city and everybody else. And I'm not the only one. And number number three is is uh, uh, August the 27th was a false FDEP city consent order, 21-0113, um, misrepresenting about the sewage discharge and, and spraying people with piss and poop. That's a big deal. And number five is the February the 12th, 2019 council meeting in which the, there was fraud. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm asking for another minute. No, sir, I see none. Okay. okay. City Thank manager, you. would you please, unless I'm wrong here, please move to consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda. Council, are there any uh, questions that you have as staff? Uh, concerning the consent agenda, I see. I see not. Council, uh, would any council members want to pull any items? I Clerk, are there any not. cards? We have um, one individual that signed up for nine items. Okay. Nine items. Um, Mayor and council, with your permission, I'd like to read the titles for the record. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda item eight A: Approve the fire department budget transfer request. Consent agenda item eight B: Approve the grant agreement for Scobie Park improvements. Consent Agenda Item 8C, authorize the mayor to sign the 2021 Tree City USA recertification application. Consent Agenda Item 8D, approve the 2022 Group Medicare Medical and Pharmacy Plan Options for City Retirees for January 1, 2022 
through December 31st, 2022. Consent agenda item 8E, approve the purchase of equipment for public works. Consent agenda item 8F, approve the annual renewal of the Memorandum of Understanding for Participation in the Finder Data Sharing Network, Florida Region 5. Consent agenda item 8G, approve advisability for social services in the Indian River City Neighborhood Zoning District. Consent agenda item 8H, authorize the city manager to sign the Coastal Partnership Initiative Grant Application Community Resiliency Stewardship Program. Consent agenda item 8I, approve resolution 36, 2021, reimbursement resolution. Thank you very much. Call the card, please. Stan Johnston. Stan, you got nine out of 11. I'm assuming you can stay on topic. Okay. Because you got I, I nine of them. You can focus and, and, and uh, stay it, attention. It's hard to, to keep up with them, I know. Okay, all right. So, so uh, get ready. Are you ready? I don't want a yes, no, maybe. I want you to talk okay, about so, these things. Go. All right. Stan Johnston, I'm a professional engineer, a licensed by the state to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And I know that Mr. Luis is going to uh, leave. Keep, come on, keep going. So let's let's go with what, what we got here. We got uh, uh, 8A is I approve that with reservations. And uh, uh, what I'm talking about reservations, when I think about numbers, there's these numbers on this sheet here that I gave you that goes through number 12. And then 13 through 18 go on this uh, September 28th uh, email that I sent to you uh, that goes through, through, through number 18. So uh, in this, this respect, we've got uh, uh, the reservations are number one, number two, three, four, five, 11, 12, 16, and the pink card. That, that, that's the little pink card. Oh, I got you. Okay, that's, that's excuse me, that's number eight, eight B. Uh, maybe I said eight A, that's eight B. Eight A is approved, eight B is approved with those reservations. Eight C is approved, eight D is approved, eight E is approved, eight F is approved, 8G is approved. 8H, I'm opposed to that regarding, and it's, uh, the numbers on that uh, that I'm opposed to that have to do with the, what I handed to you is number four, number six, number eight, number 15, and the pink card. So the next one is 8I. Um, 8I is, I put neutral on that. I don't really understand that one. I read it and I just went over it in the agenda packet, but I don't understand it. So uh, going back to uh, 8B, in which I approve with reservations, and the, 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 uh, uh, the issues are, uh, uh, the, let's see, let me pull 8B. 8B is a grant agreement for SCOBY Park improvements. That's right there at the end of uh, Main Street. And I'm familiar with that park very much, though. I used to watch the Apollo shots and uh, going to the moon from that park. Um, uh, number three is especially, uh, number three, I'm going to read a little bit of number three to you. The official approval by FDEP in August the 27th this year, uh, of a false FDEP consent order 21-0113 misrepresenting sewage discharge into the Indian River as in December the 19th. Well, we know that it did end December the 19th. We got all kinds of photos and stuff on here that, that just it just uh, didn't end. We got all kinds of witnesses and police and so forth. But yet, the city manager and so forth, and, and with the city attorney, they, they prepared a consent order of the FDEP, and you guys approved it. It's all complete nonsense. It's false. It's phony baloney. But we did it in. So, so when I'm talking about Scobie Park, that was one of the places in which we had... Likely we had a good bit of, of uh, pollution go because it went right through Gemini Park, uh, right through, uh, what do you call it, Space View Park into Gemini Park, and right into the river. And we had a fish kill in the river, too, that probably none of you know about. We had a fish kill in Space View Park, Space Sand Park Park, and the river. We had millions of gallons. In other words, it said December the 19th. So I'm reading on number, no, I'm still reading on number three. Uh, it said that it, it, the uh, sewage stopped... Uh, December the 19th, but it didn't. Actually, it went even on to, into April. Uh, the uh, December 19th was officially recognized by city and FDEP, and it was this, 
uh, FDEP was sent all these pictures and so forth, this information, and so was the Florida Today. Florida Today didn't even print it. Huh. Oh, well, that's freedom of the press. And uh, and and city continued spraying cars in, a pub, in the public with piss and poop, uh, feces and, and urine, and so forth, and viruses. Uh, uh, and that's that's uh, there's a picture of that also on there of, of the the, the fountain still turned on. And this is the the poster, the poster that I had uh, that was presented. A number of people saw it. It's in it's in your. It shows that uh, people were complaining about diarrhea, vomiting, headache, diarrhea, and so a uh, headache and uh, uh, other things, nausea, and yet, said so you didn't turn off the fountains. You didn't turn off the fountains. Can't understand it. And I'll tell you what: no city council member will talk to me about this. Not one. No city manager. No city attorney will talk about it. Even the the uh, Florida Today don't want to, they don't want to talk about it either. But they've been sent all kinds of FDEP. They won't stop talk clock. about it either. Stop the clock. This has to do with Stan, Scobie. I, Stan, I stop the clock. So hold up. First of all, I'd like to think that I've talked to you about it. Yes, sir. If, I don't think we have. Oh, I, go ahead. I think we have. Well, a little bit. All right. That being said, you're still talking Scobie Park. Scobie Park. Scobie Stay Park. Scobie right Park. there near it. Right there near it. Keep it up. Exactly. Okay. Scobie Park's right there. Scobie Park right there. And the fact is, is that we had some signs on Indian River Avenue, uh, a warning, and then they, they didn't, they disappeared. The fact is, I even had a sign over there at one of the parks, right there near the river. City had it removed. So, so, uh, uh there, there's a lot. So, so number, number three is an issue, and and I said I'm approving of, of what, what 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 we want to do, but I have some reservations. And the pink card, as you've seen before, the pink card has to do with with um, what's that club, Rotary Club, and and the uh, four four way test. Is it the truth? Is number one? Is it the truth? Well, the truth is the city is we call the city the city a space coast capital of the world. Well, it seems like to me it's the Space Coast capital of, according to this, I would say it's the Space Coast capital of dishonesty and deception. Space Coast capital of deception and dishonesty. Space Coast capital of spraying people with piss and poop. So let's go on to another one. Let me see, I dropped my stuff. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's go on to... Uh, 8H. 8H is, is I am oppo opposed to 8H. I don't know if we can cover all of these. 8H is the Coastal Partnership Initiative Grant uh, Community Resiliency Stewardship Program. Wow. 8H. And I, I circled number 8 on this. Especially on number 4, 6, 8, 15, and the pink card. The pink card has especially to do with truth. If you want to examine this thing for, for truth. So let's look at number eight. Number eight is this. Let me read it to you. Wow. For over 40 years, and continuing with our new city manager, it continues, is, is that for over 40 years, another city's fraud and deception, in other words, I'm talking about city titles, well, Space Coast capital of deception and dishonesty. For over, over, so I read here, over 36 years of uncorrected, erroneous, 100-year floodplains disputed by 1985 freshwater management study, yet unfairly and illegally concealed from the public and FEMA by the city. I'm sorry, 1936, I mean, it's 1986 to, or 85 to then. And they, so that, so what happened in 2016, finally, a Lomar was removed about 80% of homes from the firm map of Baker subdivision. That's where Mayor, uh, uh, what's his name? Diesel, Diesel's mother-in-law is, and her, one, hers was one of the homes. So 80% of the homes were removed from the f flood zone, uh, so they didn't have to pay all these uh, high insurance rates and so forth like that. But why wasn't it removed like over 30 years ago, like back in 1985? City won't answer that question. In fact, we got all kinds of missing records by the city. That's a number. So Parking Estates, Bay Meadows Subdivision, Homes Along Warrior Boulevard, I'm reading number eight to you. 
still remain in flood zones not corrected by a city's deliberate and unfair failure to notify public and FEMA of known disputes, errors of city's firm maps. So just burning money away, burning our citizens' money away. That has to do with this item. That has to do with this item because it has to do with the resilient Titusville report that the city submitted to FDEP. It has to do with this Titusville report called Resilient Titusville that is a false report, a false report prepared by our planning department that ignores the stormwater management plan, literally ignores it, literally violates it. It violates FEMA regulations and so forth. And I've said many times, and it's a number, the number on here, is that what has happened is that this, the city's stormwater management plan says clean the ditches, clean the floodways. Yet between Fox Lake Road and State Road 50, everything to St. John's River, there's six huge culverts, and none of those, those floodways are maintained. The city is responsible by its own, and now it's violate its own regulations. It's horrible. Resilient Titusville, Titusville is not resilient. Thank you very much. I'm asking for two more minutes. I see none. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, excuse me. Were there any other cards? Yes, sir. Okay. Do I have anybody who wants to comment? Okay. Member Jordan. Mr. Mayor and Council, I move that we approve consent agenda items 8A through 8I. Second. I have a motion from Member Jordan, a second from Vice Mayor. Roll call vote. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? We're 9 no. Member Jordan? Yes. Yes. <laughs> motion passes, or consent agenda passes unanimously. City Manager? On to uh, item 9A, which is a quasi judicial matter, so the City Attorney will read the process for the quasi. During the public hearing portion of the meeting, anyone wishing to speak on the quasi-judicial item must first sign a public hearing agenda card and sign the oath contained thereon. These cards are located on the table at the entrance to the chamber. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the City Council to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the City. Please submit such exhibits to the City Clerk. Actually, I believe there's a box on the table there if you have exhibits that will be provided to the Clerk. City Clerk, of all persons wishing to speak before the City Council, sign an oath card swearing to tell the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Have all witnesses that intend to speak sign an oath card swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If there is anyone present who has not signed an oath card that does wish to speak on the quasi-judicial item, please submit a card at this time. City Clerk, of all agenda items been properly advertised. Regarding ex parte communications, in the event a council member has received an ex parte communication, verbal or written, outside of the hearing, the council member shall disclose the identity of the person, group, or entity with whom the communication took place and the subject of the communication, including all opinions or facts discussed. Any written communication must be disclosed and made a part of the record. Also, in the event that a member has conducted an investigation or site visit or received any expert opinions regarding the quasi-judicial item, said visit or opinions shall be disclosed. Nothing. Anybody? I see none. The Planning and Zoning Commission considered this request on October 6, 2021, and recommended approval with conditions as recommended by staff 7 0. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to operate a mini warehouse and warehouse facility at 2060 Garden Street. Land development regulations require a conditional use permit for both mini warehouses and warehouse uses when the future land use designation is not industrial. The future land use on this site is downtown mixed use and commercial high density, high intensity. The applicant proposes to establish the use on the vacant property located at 2060 Garden Street. The property is located in a light industrial services and warehousing M1 zoning district. The property is more than 300,000 square feet and has 600 and 460 feet of frontage on Garden Street, which is an arterial roadway. Um, staff recommends that you conduct a public hearing and approve the conditional use permit application 5 2021 to operate many warehouses and warehouse facilities located at 2060 Garden Street with conditions. And Ms. Busaka has got a presentation for council. Perfect. Ms. Busaka. Yes, sir. 
This is currently an ex <clears throat> excuse me an existing lot that's adjoining a U-Haul moving and storage. And you can see the location as single family as well as uh, down as well as um, a church across the street, some vacant property, and then the U-Haul immediately to the west. The proposed conditions include a fence and vegetative screening along the residential properties. The hours of operation shall be 7 to 10, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And because there's the potential for after hours operation, individuals can go into their individual units. Uh, the staff is recommending that a lighting plan be submitted so that when they drive into the parking lot, it won't be a um, dark, perfectly dark property. And that's it. Oh, oh, did I? That is a short. I, oh, a short. see? I'm scrolling. Just like that. To that was my example. Yes. I would like to also say that we have staff has reviewed this for consistency with the comprehensive plan as described in on page 208 of your uh, documents and have found that it is consistent with the locational criteria for high intensity land use. We do not anticipate any nuisance issues related to odor, smoke, smoke, glare, and electrical interference. The staff does recommend the proposed landscape plan go above and beyond the landscape code due to the abutting residential uses. And previously, a variance was granted in 2002 and 2008, which would allow less than the 50 foot required setback, which is the reason that the staff is recommending additional screening with landscaping and a fence. And it's my understanding the applicant has agreed to that. The, there's a, we believe that this property is compatible with the surrounding land uses, specifically the commercial businesses, and that with the additional buffering that there will be limited impacts to the residential. There are special requirements related to putting uh, light industrial within this zoning district, and those are described on page 211 and 212 of your documents, and they have met all of those conditions, including minimum lot sizes. Um, in Should the city council allow the ability to require accommodations for a live-in manager, the applicant has agreed to meet this condition, but they, to my understanding, have not requested this. The operator shall main require, be required to provide locks for all units and maintain a master key to all locks. They have agreed to meet this condition as well as the conditions related to the maximum size of the storage unit and the um, parking. So the staff recommends approval because we feel that all conditions have been met and we have those three conditions as described. Very good. Any questions from Ms. Busaka, Member Jordan? Yeah, um, you actually answered the first question because I was wondering about the fence. I can kind of understand it. So is, is, is it a fence plus the um, shrubbery or is it uh, the fence and the shrubbery are not combined? They are we, we'd like to see a fence and vegetated screening because it's supposed to be a 50-foot setback and that variance significantly reduces it. Now, as an option, um, the staff feels that if the 50-foot, if the variance weren't utilized and they went back to the 50 feet, then mm -hmm. we would not require the additional vegetated. But I, my understanding is that the applicant has agreed to the additional requirements. Yeah, I, you know, I, I can hear that, but they may begrudgingly agree to it to get what they want. Oh, perhaps. That's a difference. Um, but I'm still trying to understand, that is, is a fence a wooden fence or is it a picket fence? What kind of We're fence? just asking that it be a, an opaque fence that opaque meets, fence, that meets fence. the requirements. Okay. Uh, it, it could be, actually wooden fences are usually difficult to maintain. Some, a lot of times they're PVC that right. put up and are easier to maintain. Okay. Um, okay, I'm okay with that, but I, I need to understand why we're limiting the hours of operation. Actually, it's in the code. Really? Yes, sir, that the hours of operation, and what that means is that um, there will be someone, my understanding is that there will be someone there between 7 and 5, and then after 5 o'clock, there will be availability for people to come in. And I think that the concern is people coming in at midnight to go in and to their 
storage unit. Right. Um, but there would be the opportunity, let's say that I rent a U-Haul and I don't finish my move until 11 o'clock, I could still drop off my truck. Right. They have a key drop, but that would actually be access to the uh, facility itself. Okay. Thank you. This may be a question for the applicant, but has there been discussion with the residents and what's the feedback from the residents on this issue? My understanding is that uh, we've notified the property. We, of course, have notified all of the property owners within 500 feet, and staff has not received any um, concerns expressed by the neighbors. Now, there may be someone here this evening that felt they wanted to talk in person, but the staff has not received negative comments. We'll move forward on that then. Uh, Vice Mayor Nelson. So if we were to approve it, then, Peggy, all we have to do is approve it with the three conditions laid out. That correct. staff recommendation and the planning and zoning has recommended those conditions as well. Okay. Thanks. Member Robinson. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, I'm kind of going to go along with what the mayor asked. I know all of that. I've been on that area a number of times where those uh, rental apartments are back in there. You take that road and cut in there. And um, I know that probably the the residents, uh, because I know what, uh, uh, you know, how they are um, fixed, because it's hard to find a place reasonable to live. So you're probably not going to hear a whole lot of complaints out of them at this particular time because it is rental property and uh, uh, but I, I think it would be um, uh, 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 nice somehow to touch the rental people instead of the owners. I know when you go and you put out uh, letters uh, soliciting feedback on how the uh, owners feel about uh, you know this and that happening. Uh, but especially, I know that the staff is recommending lighting, extra lighting, and uh, how much is that going to cast uh, a shadow? Happy to do my best to answer that. First of all, if you look at page uh, 218 of your documents. Page what now? 218, you'll see the okay, layout of the property. Okay. And you'll see that the, there is a significant wetland to the back of the property yes, to the north <laughs> that is intended that that will remain as is there will be no impacts there so all of the development on this site is actually on the north on the south side, south side. Mm -hmm. and it is about approximately as deep as the existing building okay. so that i don't know if that changes your concerns but when it comes to lighting the code requires no more than two foot candles at the property line. And when this comes in for its site review, we will get a lighting plan showing exactly what those lighting fixtures are and that they do not exceed two foot candles at the property line. Okay. Thank you. Any other things from council for staff? One, Member one, Jordan. Yeah. One other question. I'm, I'm looking at page 218 and we have an opaque fence and you're asking for shrubbery in front of the fence. Is that correct? Is that yes, what I sir. See? Why do you need shrubbery in front of a fence? If well, what we were thinking is that um, some of that shrubbery will go up, grow up perhaps above the fence, and that will cause, uh, if there are any noise issues, that would actually help ameliorate that. I went to FIT to speak to a gentleman who was years ago who was a specialist in sound and he said that actually vegetation does a better job of breaking up sound than a solid so that's why we are recommending the vegetation but um, it's because the vegetation looks like this and it as opposed to the sound kind of hopping over it gets broken up is the best I understand it but uh, you may want to speak to the applicant as to whether he's comfortable with this or not, but my understanding is that he's agreed. All right, I, I, I'm just not a believer in, in adding costs when 
it just seems like it's unnecessary, me being in an industrial area myself. I'm just wondering about this because you're, you're talking about sound and I'm wondering where is the sound going to be coming from? These are storage units. So where's the sound? But it will also have trucks um, that will be stored there and there will be, you know, perhaps traffic going in and out. And re remember that the, the prescribed setback here from this residential is 50 mm -hmm. feet. Right. So this is a significantly smaller setback because of those variances. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is where we move to the applicant. Would the applicant come up, please? And this is where you can kind of tell us your side of things, and we'll go from there. Your name and address for the record, please, and I'm glad you're here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Banker. I live here in Claremont, Florida. Uh, here to speak on behalf of the applicant, U Haul Co of Florida. Um, just to address a few of your questions, uh, we did work closely with staff regarding the buffering, and we were very sensitive to the impact to that adjacent residential. If you look at the site plan in your packet, we oriented the loading and unloading zones facing specifically to the west. There are no loading and unloading areas that are adjacent to that residential property. Um, we've also made sure to, to work with staff again on the, the, the privacy fence. Um, I know the report says just an opaque fence. We'd be happy to make that vinyl. Um, if that suits the council. Um, the other thing, uh, the facility is completely secured. It has external lock. Uh, each each um, um, consumer that, that uses the facility has a, a keypad access or key code access to the units. The units are all enclosed inside of a two-story building. So they will be accessing their unit inside of the building. There are no external units that, that face east or south. They're all inside of the building itself. Okay, anything uh, for the applicant council? Very good. Yeah, okay, there we go. Member Robinson. Yes, in your, I, I saw that you're going to have the, the parking for uh, recreational boats and trailers. And, no, sir. You're not going to have any of that? Okay, thank you. And I guess I'll go ahead and throw it out there just to clarify. There's not been any meetings or discussion with the residents at this time? Not at this time. No okay. community meetings or anything. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and after the cards are called, you'll have the opportunity to come in to end it. Uh, cards, please. Um, we have one card. It's Dan Johnston. Uh, Stan Johnston. I'm not opposed to this project. However, I do have some questions. And that question has to do with this uh, uh, variance related and also the CUP. So um, in this case is that I, I expect that when the city, uh, when the residents were notified they were also notified that this was a cup probably yes sir okay good that that's what my, my my main concern and the second question i have is the when the variances were um uh of 2002 and 2008 were those variances based upon a site plan or what were they based upon in other words they were asking for variances um because it seemed like if it's not it's based on a site plan this this N not necessarily apply to this or something. Tell me, can you tell me about that? Go ahead, staff. I can... This, this, the information I have is that variance two was approved in 2002 and allowed less than 50 feet required for said setback, side setbacks along the east side of the property that abuts the residential zoning and allowed the outdoor display spaces to extend 10 feet beyond the principal structure. Okay. There was a variance in 19-2008, which allowed less than the required 50-foot setback for the abutting zoning districts, which would have included the back as well as the um, side. Okay, very good. But the, neither one of the, as you can see, the property was never approved. In addition to that, there was a conditional use permit approved in 2001 for many warehouses, which expired, and a CUP in 2007 for the construction of new buildings for a large commercial facility, which also did not move forward and did um, expire. So there's been several previous attempts to develop this property, and that's all the information I have. They got stalled, huh? Yes, sir, okay. apparently. Okay. Uh, so my, the time questions. was still running while she was talking. So, so I, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking for is, is that are those variances based upon that, that have been offered? Are they variance, Are they based upon a site proposed site plan? I don't have that information. I'm sorry. It would seem like if they're based upon a, uh, a site plan, because now we're looking at something that is two-story. That's pretty high. 
and the, uh, it's a short distance between the people that are the are residences that are on uh, Old Dixie. So that's my concern. That okay. uh, if I could mention in this zoning category, the maximum height is 35 feet, perfect, which is less, okay. which is greater than two stories. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any of the cards? Yes, Council, any of the questions? Do I have a motion? Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve uh, the contingent. <laughs> excuse me. Hold on one second. My bad. Uh, applicant, you have anything else you want to add? No, Sam. Do you need anything? Okay, good. So we're going to move forward then. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor and Council, I move that we approve conditional use permit application number 5 2021 2060 Garden Street U Haul moving and storage. Second. I have a motion from so the with Jordan. conditions. With conditions, yes. Second still holds. And the second still holds from Member Stokel. Roll call vote. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. City Manager. On to uh, ordinances. First reading, this is item 10A, which is the comprehensive plan. Application number 1-2020 for Titusville Mall. And the city attorney will read the first reading. Go ahead, city attorney. Yes, Mayor. This item contains ordinance number 27, ordinance number 628, and ordinance number 29. I'll read them all at this time, but you will have to vote on them separately when this item is concluded as far as the presentation. Go ahead. Ordinance 27, 2021, an ordinance of the city of Tysville, Florida, amending the code of ordinances by amending ordinance number 60-1988, which adopted the comprehensive plan of the city of Titusville. By adopting comprehensive plan amendment 1, 2020, amending future land use map of the comprehensive plan by replacing the commercial high intensity future land use designation with the urban mixed use future land use designation on approximately 22 acres of land located west of the South Washington Avenue, east of South Hopkins Avenue, south of Country Club Drive, and north of Narvez Drive, and having an address of 3550 South Washington Avenue, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Ordinance number 28, 2021, an ordinance of the City of Titusville, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances by amending Ordinance number 60, 1988, which adopted the Comprehensive Plan of the City of Titusville, by adopting Comprehensive Plan Amendment 1, 2020, amending the future land use element of the Comprehensive Plan by changing policy. 1.11.15 to add the maximum density and intensity for redevelopment site number two, 3550 South Washington Avenue, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Ordinance number 29, 2021, an ordinance of the City of Titusville, Florida, amending ordinance number 5, 1993 of the City of Titusville, Florida, by amending the zoning map made a part of said ordinance by reference, by replacing the regional commercial RC zoning district with the Urban Village UV Zoning District on approximately 22 acres of land located west of South Washington Avenue, east of South Hopkins Avenue, south of Country Club Drive, and north of Narvez Drive, and having an address of 3550 South Washington Avenue, providing for an effective date. The public hearing is scheduled to be heard by City Council on October 26, 2021 at 630. The State Land Planning Agency had no objections to the Comprehensive Plan Amendments, the Planning and Zoning Commission, acting as your local planning agency, considered this item at their October 6, 2021, and recommended approval with conditions as recommended by staff, 7-0. Ms. Pisaka has a presentation for council. Actually, since this is first reading, I'm happy to simply answer questions unless you want me to go through the, um, the, the presentation, which I'd be happy to do at the public hearing in two weeks. It's your pleasure. Council, I, I see I'd it. Be happy with just asking asking Peggy yeah, questions. Yeah, I, I think for the first reading, I think we I'm I'm getting a let's hold on the presentation, and um, I see maybe some questions coming. So, do you have anything you want to say? Or no, sir. But I do know that the applicant is here. Right. Also. Right. Absolutely. So, if we have no questions for staff, or do I? I do. Uh, we'll go ahead and ask staff question. Vice Mayor. Peggy, I do have a question. I was concerned about the use of open spaces. And I noticed that the the ordinance, ordinances refer it, to it as a passive or active recreation area. Excuse me, could you put that back up? Because this is the map of the open space thing. 
and we're talking about, um, it looks like to me, uh, counting a parking lot as an open space because we put a bench there, um, the top of the hotel as an open recreational space. And those are the kind of things that are concerning me. And I was wondering how staff felt about that. Because to me, that's not recreation. Well, first of all, uh, Wanda, could you hand out the paper that I provided? Uh, there, there is, uh, there, there it is, thank there you. Is. This is a general description of the open space. There is also a lovely map on page 291 of your package, which also shows the open space. But you can see that most of this open space is linear and is related to the areas around the swimming pool inside of the multifamily, which is in the kind of U-shaped building there. And there is a walking trail, which you can see on this map, it's got some, I think it's red dots that kind of go around, but basically it, run, it goes around the um, interior of the property around the multifamily building, and that as well as a, through up to Country Club, around the building, it's a, um, I don't know quite how long it is, but it's a walking area which will have benches, and there is also an area, two areas that have water, I should, I don't know, I want to say water features, but um, that are stormwater related. And that most of the amenities that you see are related to sidewalks and are indeed have benches. And let me show you some of the street furniture that, so this is the kind of thing that they're talking about as far as um, the greenway there, that's the plan that shows the open space. And all those little colored dots are amenities that were within the project. This is the street furniture, examples of street furniture that they're talking about, which would be the improvements within this open space area. So the, prop, the information that is on page 260 of your uh, report, the minimum open space requirement required in UV, Urban Village, is 25%. Section 3163H of the code states that open space includes both passive recreation, such as picnic areas or walking trails, and active recreation, playgrounds or basketball courts. Most of the property in this development is the passive type and the active is actually the there is a swimming pool there for the use of the people who live in the apartments. But they're not for the public. They are not for the public. That's so correct. Does that count as open recreational? Because I was looking at and it was like we were counting the pool and we're counting the top of the hotel, the roof of the hotel. And I'm assuming that if I show up with you know, 500 of my best friends to watch lunch. Nobody's going to want me on top of that hotel. Well, that that would be the, I think the applicant would be better to answer that question. Let me tell you what the code says about the swimming pool area. A parcel or parcels of land or an open area of water or a combination of land and water within a site designated or planned as open space and intended for the use and and or enjoyment of residents of the development and or the general public. Now, okay. um, the, the staff has told both the applicant and planning and zoning that we had not been asked before about the ability to use a roof of a building as open space, so that we were looking for guidance from council and the PNZ seemed to think that it was a good idea. In fact, one member said that we are an unusual community because we have rocket 
launches and that that would be a, a good amenity to, for people to go up and have a great view. Personally, um, I think that there should be some kind of open plaza. I think that Titus Landing is a good example where there is an area that can be used for open um, park, not an open park, for recreational, for uh, special events. And I don't know if you remember this, but they can actually close off a part of the parking area as you are headed into the epic theater. There are bollards that can be put in that road so that that entire area can be closed off. In addition to that, there are some active areas in Titus Landing. I know that they have a bocce court, bocce ball court. So I personally believe that the there should be more active open space. However, our code, as you have discussed before, is not very crisp. No. And so I think that we're really looking for guidance from this um, council. I know that you have told us that you need us to move forward to change some of the open space requirements, and we have a draft this close to done, but it's not done this evening. And I'm sure that the applicant probably has some information he can provide you in addition to what I've said, and he probably is also eager to hear your comments right. or questions about this. And I, I think, I don't know how the rest of my fellow council members feel about it, but when I read the ordinance and it talks about passive recreation, i.e. picnic area, walking trails, or active rec recreation, playground, basketball court areas, which provide quality rec recreational amenities. Um, I'm not sure a hotel rooftop and that's where we need to get to the applicant and let them yeah. get that. So with that, I'm going to move to Member Stokel, and as soon as you're done, we're going to go to the applicant. Okay. Um, just wanted to clarify, have the surrounding citizens been notified about this already, and did they have any comments? They have been notified. There was a public meeting held, okay. and we have had a, some property owners. One gentleman who spoke with me was concerned about stormwater, and I explained that the project will require stormwater, and he was pleased to hear that there may be an improvement to the specific issues that he's talked about. We have had a couple of people on Narvez concerned about how close the buildings could be, and I believe that the buildings have, from the original plan, have been moved back away from Narvez, so they seem to be more comfortable. I don't know if there's anyone here this evening to comment on that. Um, we did have some discussions at PNZ about the height of the building. They have one building that will require a conditional use permit because they're projecting to go above the 60 foot approval, uh, 60 foot maximum. There was some concern about that at PNZ, but there was I, perhaps questions is a better way to state that. So okay. those are the concerns that we have seen so far. And then my last question is, if we were to approve this, are we approving that plan that's shown there as well, or are we just approving the future land use in the zoning, which could result in a different plan than what we're seeing tonight? Well, there are three pieces of this. The first is the, comp the future land use element. It, I'm sorry, let me do this in the order you have it. The first is the future land use map. Urban Village has been recommended by the US-1 corridor plan. There were three designated areas for Urban Village. This is one of them. So when uh, the applicant came in to redevelop this site, we said Urban Village is, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that the code, the, I'm sorry, the comp plan requires that once you get Urban Village, that you have a specific maximum density and intensity. That's the second piece of this. The third piece of this is the urban village rezoning, which requires the master plan. So okay. this would be essentially what you are approving. However, this has not been through full engineering, so there's still chance that it may change. And the code requires that certain changes 
can be administratively approved, such as a reduction in density. Certain changes cannot be administratively approved and have to come back here. One of those is if there is, of course, an increase in density or intensity. But in addition to that, if there's a change that would impact the perimeter of this property, that would have to come back to you. So what I can tell you is if you were to approve this, you are approving that you're willing to accept this should it be built. I have no idea whether after it gets through the development process, it will actually meet all of the ROSE requirements and it will look exactly like that. And so if that third piece doesn't happen, does all of it revert back to how it was originally or do we are we still locked in with changing the future land use map? Well, what you'll have if, if you approve the future land use change, it will be Urban Village. Okay. That's and good. so it will have to come back to you as urban village zoning, urban village zoning will have to be put on this property eventually, and a master okay. plan will have to come back to you. To meet that criteria. Correct. Okay. But that's the, currently, that's what this, the um, comprehensive plan says that this property should be. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you, Member Stokel. I'd like to move to the applicant. So if uh, Mr. Wright, you could come up and just to kind of reiterate that, uh, as you know, just to clarify, we are in a first reading. There'll be no action taken tonight. So you're just kind of filling us in on what it is and what it's about and, you know, kind of your vision. And we'll go from there. So thank you for being here, Mr. Wright. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak um, for my project. Um, as <clears throat> we discussed... And your name and your address. My name is Jesse Wright, and the property is 3550 South Washington Avenue. I live in California. I can give you the address there if you like <laughs> Um, so this project has been in making for nearly about two years now. Originally, we were planning on putting the, uh, um, the shopping centers on US-1 and having the residential on Hopkins. It just did not make any sense. We were not, I was not able to get the financing for it. Uh, one of the reason, the second reason was uh, we have other tenants there at the property, including Bills, that has a long-term lease it goes up to about 2005. So I was able to negotiate with them and uh, was able to come up with this plan. Um, in the meeting that we had on October 6, I guess one of the questions came up that, why would a guy from California come to Titusville and do this? So I give, I give that answer to you. Um, I'm originally from Iran, uh, been here since 1973. Uh, in 1980, I got my two degrees, engineering, aerospace, and mechanical, and a pilot license, and I was able to get a job offer from NASA. I was not able to pass a security clearance at that time because of the hostage crisis, and some of the people that are, um, are familiar with what happened then, um, you know, I, I was not able. So when this property came up for sale uh, back in 2017, um, I said this would be the closest point that I can get to my dream, which is NASA across the, across the river. Um, so um, since 2018, February, um, we were able to discuss with Sears prior to them filing bankruptcy that uh, they, should be moved, they should be moving out uh, from, the, from the property. And so I ended up having to pay them for them to move out because I did not want them to sublease the property and I have to deal with a sublessee. Uh, so since the uh, June of 2018, for nearly about over three years, I have promised to the existing tenants that I have met and I have signed leases with that at some point in time, Sears is becoming either going to be retrofitted or we're going to do something to it so then they can get visibility. When Sears was open, we had entrances and traffic coming in from Sears into the rest of the mall. But unfortunately, after Sears closed, uh, they have not been getting that visibility. Um, I sold the property in Northern California to be able to come up with the money to purchase this property. And so um, at this point in time, um, we've had uh, four meetings um, with the tenants uh, on the property, we had meetings with the neighbors on all sides, and also I had meetings with the dealers that we have in the Antique Mall. Antique Mall is our own business, 
we have close to about 60 or 70 dealers that are there right now. All the tenants are anticipating this project to go forward. If I may just approach the, uh, um, the drawings here, and I can kind of show you what the property looks like right now. This is Sears. Drawing. Can you bring them back over so the people who are watching can hear you on the microphone? So maybe you pull them over a little bit. That's the best I know to do. So give yes. it your best shot. Is Go ahead. Okay? Yes, I can see yeah. it. So as of right now, the antique mall is on Hopkins side here. Sears is here. Sears is about 90,000 square feet. It's been shut down. Cinema was shut down. And that's about uh, close to about 30,000 square feet. So almost half of the property has been shut down as of right now. The rest of the tenants are basically in the middle and towards the west area. Now, as you know, US-1 is right here. There's hardly any visibility for anyone to be able to see any of these businesses. This is a different view with Sears being in the front. I mean, the picture looks very nice because we did the uh, surfacing of the, uh, of the area, but you know, the auto center failed, unfortunately. And as of right now, as you know, Sears is closed down for about three years. So this is, I don't know if everybody can see, uh, this is US-1 um, out here. This is the car wash. And the apartments are basically two buildings, an L-shaped building and a U-shaped building, 340 units, with the hotel and also the, the, uh, the power center, which is about 100,000 square feet, 50,000 on medical, 50,000 on uh, offices and retail. We have two boxes in the front. We're hoping to get the antique mall into the, one of the two boxes. And we're hoping that I can make a deal with Bells to, be, to stay on the property. Um, so there is a road that goes in between the two projects from Country Club to Norvez, about 26 feet, I believe. And so the plan is to do the apartments first on a phase one, jump into the power center, and then go back into the hotel on a phase three. We would have to be demoing the mall in three phases. So phase one would be basically taking out Sears and the cinema, which is about almost 140,000 square feet. We would then have the mall to be having only two entrances, one on the north and one on the west side. Right now it has three. So it would be cut off almost about 50%. We would be shoring that up and then basically have the, this section where the apartments are going to go. And with that, um, I have put out signature cards. We have received close to about almost nearly 400 signatures. And I did not stand there and ask people to, if they're not for it, don't sign. I mean, this was right out, outside of the, uh, the, the, um, the office, and they were signed. Now, with that said, I want to just cover a couple of things. We can't satisfy everybody. This is a very dense project. This is not no Titus Landing. Titus Landing has medical and retail. We are introducing the component of the residential, which I believe it is needed. I'm also looking at a possibility of maybe doing a senior living in the L shape, independent senior living in this section right here. Since we have 25,000 square feet of retail in the bottom and below the U building, we have about 65,000 square feet of a parking. And uh, just a couple of minutes and I'll be done. Um, we talked about the open space. I have a team here. Uh, I've got Rodney, Bruce, and also Joe. Uh, Rodney will be discussing the engineering, civil engineering portion. Bruce will be covering the open space that you had a concern about. We are around 26%, minus excluding the rooftop of the hotel. And uh, of course, Joe will be discussing the, uh, the traffic. I do want to ask for a permission for the 26th of uh, this month 
to come up to actually show a three minute uh, fly through uh, 3D. And I, I was told that I have to get right. a permission to do that. If I can have your consent to be able to, because this is a large project, it's very difficult to explain this in just like a few minutes and then an hour, talking 22 acres. I mean, there's a lot that goes in this thing. And with that said, if I can have that permission, as far as the height, uh, we're going to obviously try to be within the range. But um, and I've seen projects, and I've asked a question uh, from the PNZ, and I didn't really get a clear answer. I've got to be very honest. As to why this is one city, why should there be different ordinances in terms of the height in the north or the south or the middle? Uh, so that I don't understand. But besides that, I really appreciate your time. One thing I have to mention is that these businesses are really suffering. I was the one that actually signed leases with them, and they've gone through COVID, and now they're going through all the promises that I've been giving them. I feel guilty, to be very honest with you, because I can't really uh, tell them that this project is going to take tomorrow or the next day. I'll be the first one sitting in that bulldozer taking out Sears. I invite you all to come and take a video if that happens. There you go. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Otherwise, I'd like to turn well, Before to you go, though, I think, and I'm glad you said that because I was going to bring that up if you didn't. We need to have a vote in order for them to show a video. You know how that goes. So, um, Member Jordan. Yeah, I move that we allow three minute video. Uh, yes, sir. Need a second? I have a motion from Member Jordan, a second from Vice Mayor. Let's go voice vote. All those in favor say yes. Yeah, yes. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. The video will be accepted at the next meeting. Uh, and I look forward to hearing the rest of your speakers. Thank you, Mr. Wright. If I can ask Rodney to come up first, and then Bruce, and then Joe right after that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hello, sir. Rodney Honeycutt, 3700 South Washington Avenue here in Titusville. Um, I don't have a lot to say tonight. I mean, I think this is a fantastic project. I mean, it's a real mixed-use project. We're going to have residential and retail in one spot. Um, I'm happy that somebody's willing to come in here and spend that much money to do that. I think it'll be great for us. Uh, just, a, just a few quick things. I mean, um, stormwater management. There's zero there now, and there's about zero that's not uh, hard surface or paved or a building either. <laughs> so we'll be providing stormwater treatment, so that'll be a big, big help for the Indian River. No cost to the city, no cost to the taxpayers. Um, also, uh, Hopkins Avenue has drainage that goes through this site, no treatment. We're going to add a baffle box to treat their, that runoff too. Big pluses, no cost to the city. No cost to the residences. Landscape. I didn't count, but I think there might be three trees on the site. There's going to be lots of landscape. <laughs> I miscounted. And so, um, I mean, it's, it's just a great site. A uh, lot of improvements. Um, and so, um, I'll let Bruce explain the open space, and I appreciate your support on this project. See you in two weeks. Thank you, Rodney. Appreciate it. Good evening, I'm Bruce Hall, landscape architect with Catalyst Design. Uh, address is 1951 Branchwater Trail, Orlando, Florida. Thank you. Um, as we kind of touched upon on the October 6th meeting, we, you know, some of the initial design, particularly direction from coming from Jesse, was starting on the outside, and that if, that was Country Club. Um, to make some of the improvements that are out there. We know Rodney talked about stormwater. Uh, we understand that there's some flooding issues out there, um, opportunities to calm traffic. We've introduced um, parallel parking. Um, on the south side, on Navarez, one of the keys there was create that landscape buffer, use open stormwater, and then put the fence on the north side next to the parking so that when the neighbors on the south side of the street are looking over, they're looking through landscape before they see the fence. So there's a depth there. Um, getting into the open space, uh, we looked, um, it, it was a challenge with the program. And so 
what we wanted to do was take advantage of what was described as programming for active or passive recreation. So we looked for opportunities to introduce um, multiple items throughout the project. Uh, we have oversized sidewalks in most cases. Um, typically we're closer to about 12 feet plus on the sidewalk. So um, the, the sidewalks going in front of the retail, the residential, the parking garage, will all have street trees located in them. So we're providing shade elements there. Pack the benches in. We've got residents on site, so we want to have an amenity. So the entire village functions as part of their community. So, you know, as, as the um, submittal had, we had the benches, litter receptacles. I don't think we include dog stations, but we'll have those. Um, we have um, shade structures. We'll have, you know, we've talked about bench swings. We did do a measured mile through the project and are using that. And it is a very circuitous route to get that mile, but it's a measured mile. And that provides, um, we'll have mile markers there. So it's a path that um, the area residents can also use to walk, jog. Um, and then we also looked for opportunities for public art. And really the, the thought there was that if we provided the venue or the location where public art could be placed, then management of the property could either work with local artists to get things temporarily displayed um, or bring in some sort of an art element um, as, an, as an amenity. Um, you, you mentioned the, uh, the lawn over at Titus Landing. We've, ours is a hardscape alternative, and it's the north-south street that bisects almost the center of the site. That would be designed more as a festival street so that that could have a closure. Um, and then we potentially do flush um, a curbless street. So sidewalks transition directly into the pavement so you don't have the trip hazards and, and whatnot. But that would allow, with event power, you could do art shows and you know, different different activities out there. So eventually, it, it or essentially, it functions as a lawn space. We also um, looked at the hotel, the rooftop. And while you know, I think everybody wants to go there for a launch, we did look at the square footage. And I think last week, in last week's October 6th PNZ meeting, we were somewhere about 29.6% without the roof. Top. We've since gone back and said, okay, well, let's, let's look at, you know, because we were considering um, some of the pathways that circulated through the parking lot. At the parking lot ends, we oversized the, those so that you could put benches there, litter, um, and then have a wide pathway. So we looked at some of those that are isolated and took those out of the equation um, and kept the ones that were more meaningful for the circulation around the site. And, you know, in looking at that, we've actually been able to, um, uh, took about 4.2% of the open space that we had been looking at. We're now down to, as Jesse mentioned, 26.3. And each of these open space areas has, an, has amenity elements to it. We actually have multiple stormwater, rainwater gardens um, that are associated with plazas. So there's interpretive opportunities there to talk about it. I think there's a good story about what Rodney was describing is how the stormwater flows from Hopkins over to the river. Um, so I think that's a good opportunity. And the, the swimming pool area is not included in that calculation. The, the clubhouse, um, because that would be public or private, um, that wasn't, yeah wasn't included in that. But we looked at, there's a plaza out in front of it, there's plazas around it. So we yeah, really tried to, really tried to create meaningful open space with that. So that's it. Any questions from council? I see none, thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Name and address for the record, please. Good evening, my name is Joe Rovigaro. I'm a senior, or Director of Transportation Planning for Loop Transportation in Orlando, Florida. Uh, address is 29 East Pine Street, Orlando. Um, we did the 
uh, transportation study for the comprehensive plan and based on what the original land use was the proposed land use as an urban village results in a, a decrease in the overall traffic that could be generated by what's currently out there um, we also did a, a shared parking analysis and because of the mixed use portion and, and component of this you're actually resulting in a, a reduction in the amount of tra uh, parking space that would be needed so you're not having that large open space of just parking spaces but as they've discussed the you know the integral buildings and the open and the open space so it makes a, a very nice development um, and basically I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have regarding any kind of the transportation that's been performed council I see none thank you so much are we done with the group presentation? Okay. Hi. Hi, Lisa McCotter, 515 Country Club Drive. Um, I am in support of this project. Um, as you know, uh, the property has become an eyesore with, you know, struggling to keep things going there. Um, but I'm also I'm also a neighbor. I do live about a block from the mall. So when I'm coming and going, I'm passing by this area. Um, I don't think really that the traffic is really going to um, increase, like in my neighborhood. Um, so that's a plus. It it seems like the the density of the neighbors uh, as far as on the property the residents will mostly be using us one and then with the retail coming in the back i think it's going to be very similar to what uh, is happening right now thank you thank you any other speakers from the project any other cards on this topic we have one additional card at stan johnston stan johnston Go. Ready? Yes. Go. Go. Stan Johnston. Uh, I am uh, not opposed to this project uh, for it. However, there's one concern that I do have an objection to, and that is the uh, increase of, uh, of height of a building above what is uh, uh, the zoning. In other words, the zoning, I understand, is a maximum of 60 feet high the re, whether it's a rezoning or rezoning whatever it is 60 feet high i am against any rezoning increase or conditional use permit to increase any height of building which is in, is also in agreement with which what has been uh, promoted in years past uh, historically the city of titusville has been promoted as a, a low-rise community recently it was last year that the city approved of zoning of a high rise uh, across from Sandpoint Park. I opposed that. And then soon thereafter, there was um, a movement to uh, uh, not have any more zonings of high rise buildings. If we look at Rockledge and Cocoa, we can see that those are uh, typically low rise communities. The city of Titusville, with its new rezonings, um, has become is becoming closer to Little Miami, and uh, I'm very much against Little Miami. I just don't think it's good for the for the people. I don't think it's good for the youth. It's good for anybody that wants to be at low rise, and that's what we're doing. I don't think we need it money wise or any of that other. We don't need a high rise, more high rises. So I'm against that, and and I'm not sure how the zoning has done this because um, right now the proposed site plan is in violation of zoning in other words it goes above the 60 foot so uh, i'm not sure how the city can approve it because it does not have the conditional use permit that is required to go above the 60 foot so i asked myself the question is then there is no analysis in here for a conditional use permit so the the uh, the uh, uh and i'm not sure how how i can say is who is doing right and who's doing not right but it 
it appears to me it is that uh, that that this uh, site plan uh, violates the zoning that we're giving it, and uh, uh, it, it needs a conditional use permit, um, and uh, we do not have an analysis for the conditional use permit on this, so it seems to be a uh, a logical contradiction to uh, uh, approve something that is not approved by our zoning regulations. So uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other cards? No, Applicant, Mr. Wright, you can come up and conclude if you wish. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. I, you know, I just want to mention that we have, this is a very unique project because we have tenants there. I mean, this is not Titus Landing where you take out J.C. Penney and then you can do what you want. This is not Horizon where there's a vacant land. We have to do this in a very, very um, meticulous way in order to make sure that the, the businesses are going to continue to prosper during the demolition of the portions of the mall and uh, relocating the tenants. And there is an urgency. I mean, I've got to be very honest with you. There is an urgency and because of the fact that uh, it's been three years. And every time you drive up and down US-1, you'll be able to see this ugly Sears. We've used all kind of lipstick and face up and anything we could do to <laughs> spruce it up. And we have not been able to uh, get enough visibility for the tenants. I've used multiple uh, things, signs, and so on and so forth. But um, like I said, we cannot satisfy everyone. It is a, is a dense project. If I have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, there's a couple of questions, but before we do that, I do want to say that I think this has been a, an outstanding presentation and introduction for us into what your vision is and, and where you want to go. And uh, the next meeting, obviously, we will make a decision and we'll see more, some more presentation with the video. Yes. With that, Member Stokel. Yep, thank you. First, I want to say I'm just happy that something is happening with this property. I think um, that's not one of the best areas in terms of blight for our city right now. And I, I do think that the existing businesses there have been suffering. Um, I was just curious about when you guys were designing this, some of the mixed use that I've seen has um, the residential above and more of the retail below. Did you guys think about that more in your design? Because it looks to me from looking at this, it's more residential on one side and then more of the retail on the other, except for it looks like building F has retail slash multifamily. So I just don't know if you wanted to maybe expand on that a little bit sure. to see what the thought process was. So the was. original, the original uh, concept that we had was to actually build three to four story parking structure. The cost would have been around 15,000 per space or about close to about a million dollars per, per each, each floor. Now, in that particular uh, case, um, the, the issue was whether we can actually, we were going to move all the tenants to the portion in the front um, on, on US-1. In this particular uh, concept, the reason I have the 25,000 square feet below the l shape uh, apartment building uh, is because that is the section that we want to be uh, moving the tenants and relocating the tenants to that section there. So it had to be designed in a way where we could actually build building uh, the L shape and the U shape where we can actually uh, then slowly move the tenants in that 25,000 square feet. Uh, so um, because of the number of parking that we needed, uh, I guess close to about 1,050, we're about 1,100, we're about 50, 60 parking, parking spaces more than what is required. Uh, so we had to do the first floor in the U-shape uh, building uh, where we have 65,000 square feet and about 209 uh, parking spaces and about 900 surface uh, parking spaces. That includes the ADA as well. So it was really a design where we could actually meet the tenants requirement, relocating the tenants at the same time, demolishing portions of the mall in sections, so we would do three different phases of the demolition. We would come all the way to possibly Valentino and Bell's uh, east, east wall. We would then do the apartments and also possibly the hotel 
if I can get the financing for a hotel as of right now, it's not that easy to get financing for a hotel. Then we would go ahead and demo the rest of the mall all the way to the antique mall. And at that point, we would then do the uh, power center, uh, medical and the offices. Then, then, <clears throat> then once we build the two boxes on Hopkins, facing Hopkins, we would, do, we would move the antique mall to one of the two, maybe bills to the other one. Then that would be the rest of the demolition and we're done. Now in that phase one, as I uh, promised to Peggy and also to Brad, uh, we would do, this is the heavy portion of the, of the whole project because we have to cap off two different sewer lines on the north side and also on the south side. We have to pour concrete and, and close them. And so in that portion, we have to bring a sewer line from Hopkins all the way up to US-1. So there's gonna be a lot of ditching and putting this sewer line there. And also we're gonna be doing a lot of water treatments and chambers below the parking space, so on and so forth. So we can make sure that the runoff are not gonna go all the way to, to Hopkins. I don't know if I can, sorry, to US-1. I don't know if I answered your question. Just one other thing, if Certainly. I can mention. The gentleman earlier mentioned that uh, we haven't discussed the conditional use permit. We know we have to go through the conditional use permit. I know that we have to go through the variance. I understand all that. Uh, and so uh, that is coming up. So we're not still done till we get, you know, unless we get your approval, then we can then Certainly. move forward. Yeah. As, as you were saying, I'm sure it's one step at a time. That's right. Okay. So I appreciate that. Any other questions from council? Member Jordan. Yeah, just one simple question. Uh, Titus Hill Resort and Destination, how'd you come up with that? To me, it's almost like a uh, destination or a resort because you have, I mean, if we can do the uh, uh, independent senior living, yeah, basically everything in that in that location. You know, you have apartments, you have, like in the hotel, we have two different uh, front desk. I've been in a hotel business before. So you have short stay, long-term stay. Uh, you can do shopping. I mean, unlike other projects, you have, you know, people like senior citizens or residents of the apartments that can go down and shop to go to the pharmacy, to go to doctors. I mean, you really don't need to go anywhere else. And maybe we can actually do uh, a scenario where, you know, as you come in, you just, you know, stay in, in the project. Um, I don't want to be uh, making this statement. I'm talking to Cumberland right now, uh, which is on the north um, uh, west of the project to see if we can acquire that as well. That would be an out parcel. Uh, they want to be out of that property because uh, they have other ones. Uh, they would clean the property up. Uh, they would take out all the tanks. They got three tanks that it would be taking out. So we're in discussion right now to see if we can acquire that as well as part of the project. The, the only other question, um, why Tattersville? Why are you investing in Tattersville? As I mentioned before, uh, uh, Mr. Jordan, is that um, I failed back in 1980. I, I would have been part of NASA. Um, for some of you that you may or may not know, uh, the space shuttle had a section which was not really clear to a lot of people. It's called backup flight system, a BFS. There were three people in that section that in case something happens to the shuttle, they could not bring the shuttle back. They could manually bring the shuttle back without the astronauts. So I could not get the clearance at that time. So this is the closest point that I can actually be <laughs> to NASA. And I love his space. Wow. Well, well, that's, that's something. That's quite a story. No, it really is. That's meaningful. Uh, well, thank you then. I see no other questions. I appreciate you. I appreciate your team. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. City Manager. We are to um, first reading of ordinance number 30, 2021, which is low impact development. And the city attorney will read the ordinance. Ordinance number 30, 2021, an ordinance of the city of Tysville, Florida, amending the code of ordinances to adopt low impact development standards, amending chapter 30 development standards by amending sections 30-8 technical manuals, 30-163 open space standards, 30-278 satellite parking, 30-324 landscape, and 30-337 permitted uses within the landscape buffer yard, amending chapter 30 development standards by creating Article 5, low impact development, to include sections 30-421 intent, 30-422 
lit development to include sections, I'm sorry, lit analysis, amending chapter 34 procedures by amending section 34-306 administrative waiver of setback requirements, amending the development review procedures manual by amending section 3.4 applications to be processed expeditiously, amending the stormwater management technical manual, section 7.4 stormwater management design criteria, amending the transportation infrastructure technical manual by amending sections 9.7, 9.16.4, 9.16.8, 9.17.1.1, and 9.19.3 to enable specific lid incentives, creating the low impact development technical manual by adding sections 11.1 and 10, 11.2 goals of, in, low, of low impact development, 11.3 low impact development plan, 11.4 operations and maintenance O&M documents, 11.5 low impact development lid best management practices, BMP list, 11.6 low impact development incentives matrix, and 11.7 minimum parking requirements for development utilizing low impact development, providing for severability, repeal of conflicting ordinances, an effective date, and incorporation into the code. The second and final public hearing is scheduled to be conducted by City Council on October 26, 2021 at 630. The Titusville Environmental Commission considered this ordinance at their May 12, 2021 and June 9, 2021 meetings and recommended several changes to the ordinance, which are attached. The TEC recommended that all terms, such as encourages or encouraged, to be required or requires. The Planning and Zoning Commission considered the ordinance on their meeting on July 7, 2021 and recommended approval 7-0, including the TEC's recommendations requiring the project to utilize more than one BMP and that 50% of stormwater be processed through LID techniques and adding additional whereas clause. And Ms. Pisaka is here to answer any questions that you may have on this your first reading of 30, 2021. You mean you don't have a presentation? Since it's a first reading, I can um, stop that mission I'm if you'd like. You, you've been presentation back and forth today. Uh, council, anything for staff? Uh, Vice Mayor. I have a I have a question for you, Peggy. I, I sort of went in this with the idea that um, we should do the carrot and the stick and sort of get people using LID by doing incentives. But then I started looking at the list of best management, management practices. And I was like, they're really not that onerous or don't seem to be. So should we skip the carrot? <laughs> I don't thank, know the answer. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. The staff does not have the performance standards and some other technical data that could make this mandatory. For instance, we would need an analysis of soils within the city to determine which soils will work with which um, uh, LID techniques okay. to, in order to make it mandatory. And then we'd need performance standards to determine what the regulation have they met. We estimate that, that putting together that information will take between fifty dollars and $100,000 and will take an additional year. So if you'd like to wait and make this mandatory, then I'll see you in a year after we get the $100,000 added to our budget. Uh, my suggestion is if you want to move forward with LID that we start here and then should we be given the additional money in the budget, we can begin the analysis that would be required to make this mandatory. Okay, fair. So to understand right this minute on this date, we need to go incentive based. We, I think that, uh, you know, uh, LID is very important. Uh, and I'm not going to speak for anybody, but that aside, the question is mandate or incentivize. And right at this very moment, due to the studies that have to be done, et cetera, mandating it is not a real option. You won't get it done for a year as our estimate. If you look on page 355, there's a chart showing all of the different incentives. And they include less parking requirements. 
They include smaller parking spaces, uh, landscaping credits, open space credits, reduced setback, additional building height, additional density, expedited applications, reduced stormwater. And so I think that there are enough that people will want to take advantage of this. At least we've had, we've, you've seen some projects come through right. where people have voluntarily right. done it without the incentives. So I, I believe that this is an excellent first step and gets us moving expeditiously. Moving in that direction yes, with sir. incentives and see how it works for the yes. year if we move to mandatory. Absolutely. Member Robinson. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Peg, I, I read through this and kind of studied my way through it. And uh, as I mentioned in, in one meeting, you have a lot of... Uh, first and uh, this is the first time we've done this I got them highlight we are mending this adding that and, and so forth and I and I truly understand that this LED, uh, LID is is a, is a big step and it's a lot of things that can be done it's a new opportunity to to look at things <clears throat> one of the uh, and this may tie in with what uh, 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 member Julian uh, uh, had uh, to say because it is, uh, if we know a lot of history about the land, some conditions and, of rain off and, uh, you know, and, and try to improve them from that particular point. And I know that that's a lot of back work that we, we have to get done. Uh, so that, uh, but it is an opportunity to, uh, to do things right for the future and, and, and make everyone happy uh, uh, with it because if we do enough uh, of, of research, and we can be able to uh, to tell the difference of what used to be and and what it's going to be as we move forward. Uh, but if we don't uh, have some of that, and so I know that we do have some history, uh, uh, some history of the different land masses in our area, uh, so we can re kind of research that and get some data from those. And then uh, um, uh, with all of the uh, innovative ideas and, and so forth, that's, that has came forward and that has continually come to come forward, we can uh, we can see that different from what it used to be, and as the uh, the um, the construction goes in and the development goes in, and what is being put into those things and uh, what uh, it will be uh, once it's completed, uh, and I, I, again, like I said, it's, it's it's time for us to monitor it and and do our best. This is a this is a this is a good plan from where we started. I know some of it existed, a tiny part of it existed be, before, but uh, I, I think that the, the energy still should be moving forward to, to take the past uh, 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 and look at it, see what it was doing, and, and then uh, as we uh, move into the future and see how we can make it, you know, make it better and, and be able to come up with some percentage, some calculations to do that. Okay. Very good. Anything else from council? Uh, call the cards. Um, Tony Sheffalo. You know the routine. Tony Sheffalo, the historic Norwood House, Titusville. LID is coming to you with recommendations from TEC and PNZ. Isn't that the point? Lately, everyone, everywhere one turns for information or entertainment, there are disturbing revelations of dire, extreme environmental situations, mostly man-made or induced as a result of man's effect on the geology. Many studies are laying out the effects of Florida ecology specifically. We in Titusville are in a position to guide our ecological future today. But you on city council are charged with the obligation to guide our future from many fronts. How can you be expected to be up to date on all the environmental studies specific to the Indian River Lagoon, the St. John's Waterway, the retention pond studies, or the wastewater research um, that um, Brevard Natural Resources, Virginia Bartley is presenting? And how can you be expected to do, to do all that when your agenda packet is often the size of a novel, up to 200 or more pages? 
<laughs> so maybe, maybe it's time for you to relax your time constraints some by listening to your citizen advisory boards after you empower them to do the work the city charter charges them with. I'm referring to the Planning and Zoning Commission's hard work with developers and the Titusville Tree Team and Associates on the new tree protection ordinance. The version you passed, and I thank you for passing that, was watered down and not significant enough to save many valued older native trees, and allowing burning on site is a slap in the face to all environmentally conscious people. I don't know how any of you thought that was a good idea. But I'm referring to the Titusville Environmental Commission, charged by the current land development regulations to be the Tree City USA Tree Board and the Community Forest Program Directors. And their responsibility is spelled out to study, investigate, counsel, and develop, and update annually, and administer a plan for the care, preservation, pruning, planting, replanting, removal, or disposition of trees, shrubs, in parks, along streets, and in all other public areas. Their job is so comprehensive, you don't have to worry about gateways. You can trust your own TEC and P&Z commissions. So in order to keep Titusville from becoming the, what was Mr. Fisher's reference, the armpit or the elbow of Florida, you, as the final arbiters of the people's will, should listen to the experts on your advisory boards and advise staff to formulate and code enforcement and inspectors signing off on permits, please, 10 seconds, yeah. to really inspect and enforce. That will allow you some time to examine the profits versus the expenditures of new development and that development's impact on the Indian River Lagoon now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next card, please. Last card is Dan Johnston. You fooled me. I thought you were packing up. Yeah, I was. I was packing up. I'm going to leave after, right after this. Okay. So, uh, because uh, I got to babysit. Go ahead. Uh, I got. I do some. You can start the clock. I got to do some babysitting for two grandsons. Uh, but on this uh, LID, uh, my notes on this is that. Uh, 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 number 16 and number 18 apply to this uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, development concerns the comp plan and so forth, and it, and it, it concerns what's going on here. Uh, I noticed that, uh, um, that, that in spite of all this information that I provided to council, is that, that uh, the rating that you've given the city manager in, in council's agenda packet is High, 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 very high. I mean, this guy is has really snowed you guys, really snowed you, and 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 uh, uh, so number sixteen and number eighteen refer to uh, what's what is going on, and that that is uh, has to do with number sixteen, number eighteen, failure to respond to questions. Uh, for example, uh, questions you're asked, city does not respond. He has a closed door policy. And, and, and as far as everybody's concerned, everything, that's, that's fine. Uh, so, but it's not, it doesn't apply to LID. I mean, I mean, I, say, I mean, it should not apply to, to what's going on in the city. Uh, this is uh, not in, uh, and I've, I've sent to you all this is about the health, safety, and welfare, that it's, uh, we've got oh, problems. And this, this does concern LID. And so what I wrote here is, yet City Council, PNZ, TECR, FDEP, and so forth, uh, and the new form these uh, uh, do not even attempt to, to look into these problems or the questions. Uh, why ask them? 50% of the general budget is, is spent on public safety. This has to do with public safety, LID does. If so, why didn't our city turn off the fountains with spray cars and, and public with um, so forth? Why did the city use employees not trained to not vaccinate with sewage? Next one, number 18. Let me go quick. Out of date comprehensive plan. That has to do with LD. In other words, when you use our LD, we have an outdated coming that is based on, right here, I'll read it to you, outdated area of critical concern mapping. That's number 14. I want to go read number 14. Don't have time. Erroneous flood zones, firm map. That's number six. I'm not going to read you number six either. Approximate wetland mapping. In parentheses, I wrote, 
rather than actual surveyed wetland boundaries, in parentheses, and open recreation, OR zoning, ridiculously mapped in 1993 by use of soils maps of the Brevard County Soil Survey. The city's comprehensive plan and zoning in many respects is just a bad joke, and we're continuing with it. So uh, in order to, to really do our LID, or LID, is we really need to uh, look into our comprehensive plan and correct the errors. Thank I'm you. leaving. Thank you. I'm glad you're, you're probably happy I'm leaving. Any other cards? No other cards. Okay, then. Um, this is a first reading. We have no vote tonight. We'll move it over to city manager. Uh, we're on to uh, 12A, which is Verona Village B sketch plat. Verona Village B is a proposed 173 lot single family subdivision on approximately 117.06 acres located west of Willow Creek Boulevard north of Verona Phase 1 subdivision. The overall Verona development, formerly known as Willow Creek, consists of 675 plus or minus acres. In 2016, the remaining portion of the development, excluding Phase 1, was rezoned to planned unit uh, development zoning PUDZ to allow for an additional 1277 residential units and 172 acres of commercial and light industrial use. The submitted requirements for the sketch plat are listed in your packet, the development review procedures and technical manuals. Staff is recommending that you approve sketch plat for Verona Village B. Verona Village B is a proposed 173 lot single family subdivision on 117.6 acres located west of Willow Creek Boulevard and north of uh, Verona. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval 5 to one commissioner that voted no expressed a desire to table the item. Ms. Bisak is here to make a, a presentation to you. This is uh, a sketch plat and I'd like to explain to you what Section 34151 states about sketch plats. It says a complete submittal as set forth in Section 34152 shall be made to the administrator. The administrator shall determine completeness of determine completeness of any sketch plat submittal. Once the application has been determined to be complete, the sketch plat will be scheduled for review in accordance with the review schedule. The staff has determined that the application is complete as described in your package on pages 381 and 382 <coughs> require shows all of the uh, required submittals and the information has been submitted as required finally what will ha what will happen next is that this will go through a preliminary plat which will be the engineering and the detailed review and then it will finally at final plat come back to this council for approval before the final plat is approved i know that there are going to be questions so i will wait until i get questions so that i know what you're interested in okay um city attorney do you need to read anything concerning quasi-judicial no sir the rules i read on quasi-judicial earlier apply to this item Say that again? The rules that I read previously for quasi-judicial items apply to this item. Okay. So same thing is in play. If, if, if council has had any ex parte communications, you would need to disclose those. Right. But all the same rules will apply to this item. Okay. And, and I thought maybe you just asked that every time. That's why I asked that. Because I just fullness, I did have discussion uh, and visited the site, I don't know, two months ago maybe. And uh, just wanted to get that out there. Um, okay, then we would have the uh, anything from council, anything to Ms. Busaka? I see none. It's after 8.30. Member Jordan doesn't ask as many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, applicant, I would like the uh, applicant to come up. If we have an applicant here for this uh, sketch plat. And you can uh, name, address for the record, anything you want to add, and then any questions we might have. Thank you. Not, uh, a little taller, I guess. Um, thank you uh, for having us here tonight. My name is Brian Ashby with Kimley Horn. I'm the civil engineer of record uh, with the applicant. Um, 
uh, address 4106 Terrywood Avenue um, from Orlando, Florida. Uh, we've worked hand in hand with staff since March on this sketch plat. Uh, it's gone through a couple different ebbs and flows from the site plan that you have before you today. We've really tried to work with the landscape that is Verona, uh, as well as the master plan that was approved back in 2016. Um, we've looked to preserve as many wetlands as possible. Uh, there was a couple cut throughs that we took out right. uh, completely from the plan. Um, we've really narrowed the, the, uh, the road that you see on the plan today to go through the narrowest portion of the, of the site where we would have wetland impacts. So with that, um, again, we've amenitized Willow Creek Boulevard itself uh, with, a tr with a trail, uh, different wetland educational uh, pedestals, overlooks, benches, um, some fountains along the road as well. And we think this project is, um, you've seen the first phase come through and also Village D, and we feel like this, is, this will be an added benefit in the continued progress for Verona and a need for the community for housing. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? I see none. Cards. We have Any Steve Foca. I'm Mary Spar. Trying to pa have this passed out. I Good to see you again. Probably um, used the wrong procedure. Um, okay, so my name is Mary Spar. Um, I live in Coco. Um, I've reviewed the sketch plat for Village B, primarily in terms of wetland impacts. At first, I thought that Village B would, in some way, be bound by your comprehensive plan wetland <coughs> residential impact limitation of uh, for wetlands at least five acres in size and that's one re um, one residential unit per five acres but last Thursday I found out that um, your comp plan uh, limitation of one unit residential unit for five acres this doesn't apply because of a land use change this is kind of a unique situation but um, the applicant can voluntarily reduce his wetlands impact to the maximum extent feasible. And a voluntary compliance with the spirit of the comp plan is exactly what appears to ha have happened in Village D, which also was not bound by the comp plan um, conservation limitation. So I sent you a letter, hopefully you got it. I know three of you did. Um, with a chart and it compared the wetlands impacts in Huntington Park, uh, Verona Village D and Verona Village B, and what I passed out um, is is the chart from the letter. And um, Verona, okay, Huntington Park had to comply with this one unit per five acres, um, and the percentage of impact, wetlands impacts was 1.8 percent. Um, no houses. Uh, cited uh, in wetlands. Now, Verona Village D, they voluntarily complied. Um, same percentage of wetlands impacted happens to be the percentage for one unit per five acres. And no houses cited in wetlands. But for Verona Village B, they don't have to comply with this limitation. Um, and their percentage is 12%, uh, which is six or seven times greater than the other two developments. And they have 11 houses, which would definitely be impacted by, I mean, 11 houses that are definitely cited on the wetlands. I'm not counting the peripheral uh, wetlands. 
So um, I'm hoping that you can just ask them if they can do a little better on this. You know, maybe try to emulate the other two developments. Um, because, oh, I'm sorry. Could I please have one minute? Yeah, um, can I have a motion? Motion, all in favor, yes, go. Okay, so um, they're gonna use your decision and take that information and then go to the St. John's to get their um, updated permit. And so it's kind of important what you decide because it's gonna determine how it's gonna turn out. Um, I also think you can solve this problem of, you know, this loophole by which this development didn't um, have to comply with the um, wetlands limitation by when, when you adopt your 2040 plan, you can make a little change that would solve this problem for good. And so I'm just asking you to see if um, there's a way to get them to reduce the, um, their wetlands impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other cards? Uh, Maureen Roop, and she's the last card. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh. You kind of get, I get in trouble sitting next to you. And then I get in trouble with you. Hi, uh, name Hi. and address for the record, please. Uh, Maureen Roop, Port St. John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to speak off the cuff here. I have never been able to understand how a, a city council, how a county commission, how the state can sanction filling in wetlands when we live in a natural swamp. Honestly, doesn't make sense. Now, it, I thought to myself, would I want an house? Would I want to buy a house that had been filled in from wetlands? And do they tell the people that are looking to buy these houses that they were wetlands and they've been filled in? I mean... <laughs> This is potential flooding of surrounding properties and these houses. And I just don't know what this would mean to the people that was going to buy these houses. Would they still buy them, do you think? Uh, insurance may be higher if the insurance companies knew that they had been... Uh, built in wetlands. Uh, I don't know, but it begs a lot of questions to me, a lot of questions. And I guess all I can do is bring attention to what I consider a quality of life problem. Thank you. As always, thank you. And that was the last card. Uh, Council, any questions for... Okay, uh, then we bring the applicant back up. And if we have any questions for the applicant, and if there's anything you want to respond to that you just heard, you don't have to. I'm just saying that it's your call. You're the, you're the cleanup. I would love to. Um, regarding the, the initial comment uh, about the one to five acreage, um, we are a future land use of PUD and not a future land use of conservation. If we did have a future land use of comfort, conservation, absolutely, we would have to follow the comprehensive plan to a T uh, underneath that future land use ordinance, uh, or sorry, element for conservation. Um, we have existing Army Corps of Engineer wetland lines and impacts that we have to stay to. We cannot go above and beyond those, um, and we are doing that with that plan. So these wetland impacts have already been permitted through the Army Corps. Um, they will additionally go a next step to the St. John's River Water Management District at time of final engineering. Uh, regarding the comment to flooding, um, part of the final engineering, uh, we're not in a floodplain. Uh, this project is not. Uh, village 
D was, uh, regardless of that, uh, in good engineering practice, we ensure our total outfall from our project will not increase flood stages both upstream or downstream of us. We are sizing these ponds to totally retain the volume necessary in order to do that, and that will be provided to the city for review. And then regarding some elements that we've kind of worked with staff on uh, during the whole sketch plat process, we've given up about four lots uh, to preserve some of the larger trees on the site um, where uh, under the old ordinance, which this sketch plat is under for the tree ordinance uh, that was approved not that long ago, the old tree ordinance, which we are under, uh, we're actually saving additional trees, larger trees over 20 inches on four different lots that, that the applicant, that the owner gave up in order to just kind of help bring a sense of the environment because we are building in a natural environment, that great buffer that you have so you don't have people in your backyard. Um, it's a great amenity personally, I believe, uh, and, and with these preservation tracks that we've added, we think it's just another added benefit. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, Member Jordan. Yes, I apologize if I don't sound right because I am sleepy, as I told you. It's after. It's, it's almost nine, nine o'clock, so um, so I better ask my question before I forget. Um, Mary said something, and I think you answered it as far as she wants you to do better, and you're saying this is as good as it as it gets uh, under the circumstances, and you've given up four lots as it is right correct we've worked with city with uh, staff on locating probably the, the the lots that would be of a, the greatest impact to the community as far as preserving the natural trees that are out there the large trees specimen and heritage trees that are out there and on the sketch plat we've removed approximately four lots in order to do that um, with the way the land is right now and the way that we've uh, laid out the streets we believe that yes this is the least impactful without totally getting rid of a large portion of this project and it becoming pretty much infeasible well when you look at the overall project and you're certainly doing a great job of lid actually if you if you look at it and preserving of trees um, and all of that and uh, maureen said something because yes maureen i listened to what you say but um i i kind of disagreed with her because she was questioning, you know, filling in wetlands and putting the house on and all this good stuff. And the first thing in my mind is, I'm a civil engineer too. I'm saying, hey, you know, this is not something new. I mean, you do it all the time for sure. So it's not, you got good engineering practices to make sure that, you know, a house is not going to go into um, this area, if you will. You do a lot of compaction of dirt and all, all that good stuff. So I don't have a, a problem with that at all. So. Um, with the sketch plan, you can go forward and um, get this thing done. If anyone has not been out there, I, I would suggest you go out there because every last one of the houses you look at it, it's, it's backed up against a preserve. I mean, it's got a lot of trees there for sure, and uh, it's a beautiful site for sure. And I think it's a, it's a good example of, of what LID uh, can be uh, under the circumstances for sure. So I uh, appreciate the you appreciate we appreciate those comments. All right. Uh, I would add, add to Member Jordan's words that I noted earlier I had been out there and I, I've spoken to most of you in some way, shape, or form. And uh, I would say, and, and I'm not the expert and I don't run around and see all those, but uh, that's one of the the better taken care of as far as having the trees it, behind you. Um, the backyard is not, like you said, butting up to the other house. So uh, there's a lot of preserve and it looks really, really nice. Um, What's the difference? You mentioned if you guys were in the uh, conservative, meaning the uh, conserv you had to conserve, yeah, versus the PUD. Now you're, you're under the PUD, correct? Right, and yep. you had said if you were under the conservation, what's that called? What would that be called? That would be we would be underneath the conservation future land use. Right mm -hmm. there, there you go. See, That's, like I said, I don't do this every day. Uh, What's the difference between that and the PUD, the PUD? So a PUD has to go through kind of similar to sketch plat where you have to actually go through and get an ordinance passed for, uh, you work with staff and PNZ to come up with densities, design standards, 
everything under the sun that would normally be in your land development regulations. And some of them are just carryovers from your land development regulations. But in this case, the PUD allows a density over the whole site of 1,277 lots for future development, plus a commercial piece up at the north end. If we were part of the conservation future land use and followed that, th those requirements within the future land use element, we would be limited to one unit per every uh, uh, five acres. Okay. That, that clears that up. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I'm glad I asked that. That, that gives a visual there and, uh, and very uh, clarity. Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, Ms. Busaka, how, can I ask you how you guys feel about it? Is this... Let me go back to the comprehensive plan amendment that was in 2016 that moved this property out of conservation and into the plan development. Correct. The analysis at that time showed that under the future land use that was on that site at the time, including 230 acres of conservation at one dwelling unit per five acres, there could be a total of 3,381 units on this property. Under the current zoning, the, cur the zoning that was current at that time, including one unit per five acres in the open space recreation, there could be 3,143 units. This entire property has 1,277 units. So there has been a significant reduction in the number of units. Under one unit per five acres for the 230 approximate acres of wetlands, there could be 46 units in those, in the wetlands. Um, if I take the information that Ms. Spar was kind enough to provide, there has been zero units in Village D and 11 units in Village B. So that is significantly under the 46 units. Now there is still Village A and C to come, but if I think what, and this information, if you haven't seen, you this is the... Um, master plan, if you want a copy there, Wanda has one that, that was approved for the entire property. So if you look at the in property as a whole, and this is the second phase of that property, there is an approximation of 32% um, of the site is preserved in conservation. That's a total of 100 and... Let me see, I have this number here. Um, 223 acres of wetlands on site. Of that, there are a total of 13.7 acres in the entire property that are being developed. And the rest wetlands. of the property is remaining in conservation. On this particular parcel, there is 45.15 acres of conservation and four acres of wetlands being impacted, 4.9 acres of wetlands being impacted, including the um, roads, not only the roads, but... Okay. And then let me just comment that this is strategy 1.16.2.1 of the future land use element. I'm going to read in part. If the environmental assessment indicates that only wetlands are president, present and the wetlands are to be preserved rather than mitigated, the city shall accept the wetland delineation and amend the future land use map to align the conservation land use. Clearly, this strategy anticipates that some wetlands could be impacted and mitigated. And in this case, the mitigation includes a total requirement of 173 acres preserved, 43 acres of uplands preserved, a wetland enhancement, meaning they're improving the wetlands of 38.7 acres, and then there is, an, on top of that, mitigation credits that have been purchased as part of this permit. So in staff's opinion, this is consistent with the comprehensive plan, and if you look at the project as a whole, you'll see that there is a small percentage of wetland impacts in this area. The developer has worked with staff, as he mentioned, to save trees as well as we've done some minor redesigns of where the um, open space trail is that okay. to minimize the amount of wetland impacts. 
So that's the staff's perspective. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then. Any other cards? Just that was a no? No. Okay. Uh, we're ready to move forward then. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve Verona Village B sketch plat. Second. I have a motion from Member Jordan for approval and Vice Mayor Nelson with a second. Roll call vote. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. City Manager. On to uh, item 12B, which is the airport entra entrance connector road. The Tyco Airport, in partnership with KB Homes, uh, is in the design process of building a connector roadway between State Route 407 and Grissom Parkway to serve the KB Homes development and the airport's needs. In order to make the connection to 407, which is a limited access roadway, FDOT has requested that the city be the maintenance entity responsible for the maintenance of the roadway. Um, the attached documents show the layout and typical sections of the roadway as proposed by the airport authority. The city is not in partnership in the construction of the project as it's funded by the airport authority and KB Homes. The, de the dedication of the right of way will come back before council for review and approval of that at a future date. It's recommended the City Council approve the City Manager to provide a letter to uh, FDOT acknowledging that the City will accept the public roadway dedication from Tyco Airport Authority and provide roadway maintenance of the proposed roadway as shown on the agenda packet upon review and acceptance of the roadway that's met design and construction to City standards. Any, I don't, staff's no. not going to be there. So, um, Nobody asked questions of so council anything on that member Robinson. Yes, I I, I, uh, I was explained to it how it cuts through and everything is clear and it looks good I think it would be a it'll be a plot Anybody else Any cards no cards member Jordan Mayor and Council, I move that we approve the city manager to provide a letter to the Florida Department of Transportation, acknowledging the city of Titusville will accept the public roadway dedication from Tyco, Tyco Airport Authority and provide roadway maintenance of the proposed roadway. Second. I have a motion from Member Jordan, a second from Vice Mayor. That's a long way from so moved, by the way. Oh, yes, <laughs> uh, roll call vote. Uh, Member Robinson? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. I would just like to add, I think it's an excellent idea, and I look forward to that road coming through. Uh, I, I really do. I can't tell you how much I think that's going to help, and certainly I've heard from the airport people saying the same thing. So with that, we move forward. Yes, Mayor, we're on uh, petitions and requests of the public present non-agenda items. Thank you, guys. There he is. Quiet. He's got the hair redone. Nathan Slusher, 860 Allendale Street. Um, tonight, I actually have a request. I had a, uh, I followed the MEMS fluoride vote very heavily. And the one thing that I didn't see as much as I wanted to was the public works actually involved, the people who actually deal with it. But I did have something brought to my attention that I've been trying to research and I got nothing. And that's how is that acid that's going in the water affecting the lagoon? And I can't find the answer to it. So I want to know if it's possible to request samples, uh, to take samples in Titusville in different spots and have the water department test and see if it's actually making it to the river. Explain that to me again. So we put the acid in the water at the water facilities. It's used in sprinklers. It's used in tap water. Is that acid making it parts per million to the lagoon? Can we pull samples from the lagoon along our shores, whether it be on US-1 or down near Tranquility or up by the bridge, and test to see if it's in the water? Well, I don't have uh, Mr. Stouffer here today because he'd be the first that, one to ask. That is why I, I would then say city manager, and I wouldn't be surprised if we said we need to defer. But go ahead. Yes, we, we wouldn't be testing the lagoon. 
Say that again. You didn't the, city, do? the city wouldn't be testing. Oh, OK. OK. Like a, um, that's certainly not something on our plan sheet right now. We don't have the ability to do that. OK. You know who might do it? I don't. Marine Resources Council. I actually will be at their, their place uh, next week. Yeah. So the mayor may have a uh, I will. Uh, for you. I, I, yeah, I will. I'll, I'll put that in a text to myself, and I will see. I think hey, the we reason have, I we ask have a citizen is... who asks about the acid measuring in the lagoon, and that will be a big topic. So that I... topic was very heated on a personal level, but I think if it it really hit me that it could be affecting the lagoon, and when I tried to research it, I just online there's nothing. There was absolutely nothing on it, and I said, "Wow, I don't know if anyone's actually thought of it." Because we know any of the fertilizers we put wash down, why would the stuff in the water that we're spraying, the sprinklers, not wash down too? Well, I do always appreciate you thinking ahead of the curve. I do. I don't always, most of the times I don't have an answer. <laughs> but with that being said, um, like I said, it's just next week, I think, um, we go to uh, uh, their seminar. So I, there's got to be a time in the two, six, two, eight hour days in there I can ask a question. So... Next meeting, call me on it. Okay. All right, thank you. Can I clarify a oh, question yes. real quick? Are you wondering, are you talking about the fluoride that goes in? Are you talking about like specific chemicals that we treat our drinking water with? Like the, what is it that you're exactly wanting to I see? did a tour of the water facility and they put the <clears throat> hydrofluorosilic acid, the fluoride acid in the water and they test the water downstream for that. Mm -hmm. I want to know if we test the water in the river, if it will show that our what we're putting in the water is affecting the lagoon. Okay. Because that test hasn't been done, or at least it's not been done publicly, where someone says, hey, I've done this, and put that info out on the, for everyone to see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Did that clarify? Mm -hmm. right. Valid question. A valid question. So we'll, we'll see what we can do with it. All right. Thank you. Um, Anybody else for petitions or requests? I don't see anybody. Okay, city manager. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on to mayor's report. And as a reminder, um, the was brought up earlier in the meeting uh, an ADA presentation by Ms. Parrish. Maybe as right. Let me a, let me do that for we go on because I wrote something down on that. Um, and I was going to say the same thing. It was mentioned uh, by the best buddies that um, in our next meeting actually it'll be the presentations meeting at five thirty. Will not presentations meeting at 5 30 Delana Parrish would like to do a presentation I, I don't I've asked for 10 minutes or less we will see I, but they did ask me uh, on hiring equal opportunity for uh, ADA um, disability people I don't know if any of you know Delana Parrish but um, she is uh, quite uh, inspiration she speaks nationally um, she's certainly got a disability that she has overcome I think it's a privilege to get to see her for the five or 10 minutes we get. And then I want to do a mayor's proclamation. So whether we do the presentation or not, I'm going to do a proclamation to her. Uh, but at the same time, I would ask that we allow her to give a presentation on her life and what she's achieved with her disability. I need a motion. I will make that motion. Vice mayor's made the motion. Member Jordan has seconded. Let me go roll call vote on that one. Member Jordan? Yes. Mayor Diesel? Yes. Vice Mayor Nelson? Yes. Member Stokel? Yes. Member Robinson? Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, I know that they will be appreciative. Um, she will be here. Mom will be here. Some of the same students may be here to see her, but uh, very motivational. And you'll be inspired by it. And the, sometimes when you think, gosh, I can't get out of bed today or this or that, she'll make you feel like get your butt up and move. <laughs> So that being said, I look forward to that, and I thank you for that. Um, uh, anybody else on council report? I really don't either, except to uh, mention, uh, and I didn't know, maybe Member Stokely, you're going to that same event. The No? Mm -mm. Uh, I think I said this once before, but let me say it because it's pertinent. Um, next Thursday and Friday, I think, I'm going to the LID. I don't even know what to really call it, but it's a seminar. Um, and uh, I looked at the agenda today. I'll be at very much most of it, but I, I, eight to five every day. 
<laughs> it's like, woo. But I, I do, I look forward to it. And uh, so I will be there next week, like I said, Thursday, 8 o'clock till 5 o'clock with a couple breaks. And Friday, 8 o'clock till 5 o'clock. Um, with that, uh, Member Stokel. I'm going to be kind of short. Just want to let you know that I'll be going up to Tallahassee next week to meet with some of the representatives and senators about some home rule issues. One I just found out about last night at the Space Coast League of City meetings, a Senate bill that was filed that would essentially require counties and cities to prepare a business impact statement before voting on any ordinance. So they're really kind of, I think, trying to crack down and invade some home rule issues. So I will keep you guys posted on that. Um, I know the city manager is going to talk about it probably on his report, but I just want to say doing those evaluations for the city manager, I feel like I'm all around a lot of city managers just with the Florida League of Cities with ICMA. And it's hard to put this in your evaluation, but we really are blessed and lucky to have such a great leader. So I know I don't say it often, but I appreciate you. And, you know, and I think that it's just appropriate that I follow it up because actually I do say it often. You know, sometimes you look embarrassed to have me say it. You kind of look the other way, but uh, uh, I hope the evaluation says it all. And, and there's times, and I've done a million teacher evaluations and a million evaluations, and you try to start in the middle and see if you go up or you go down or whatever, but it's hard not to start at the top. And... Um, like I said, I, there, were, there are times as an evaluator, you try to find a place where you can, well, it's not perfect there. And they think, well, yeah, he pretty much is. So uh, as far as keeping us informed, and, and, and I, again, I turn off the TV on this. I don't want to say no. Um, and again, the things that are just, you keep us informed. And, and I can tell you as a mayor, um, you're even more informed as a mayor than, than I was as a vice mayor and, and a member. Don't misunderstand me. You guys are totally informed. But when there's something coming up, I, I, I'm never surprised. Well, normally they're, they're calling me, to be honest with you. Um, gosh, I, I get calls for all kinds of things, and we won't go into to all those. But uh, I seek your advice. Well, let me put it this way. I seek his advice a lot more than I did when I wasn't the mayor. I seek his input. Do I respond to this? That's a, that's a big question I ask a lot of times because I get things now I didn't used to get. It's like, do I respond to this? Now, when I was at the high school, it was easy because I responded to everything. But there's a lot of things that are tricky, and, and both of you guys, quite honestly, do I, is this mine? Is this my lane? Um, you know, how do I do this? And um, within five minutes, I've either got a, a reply or a phone call. And I can't tell you how much, and I'm sure you guys are the exact same way. I've just noticed as you, you move to the mayor spot, everybody thinks you know all the answers and that every lane's your lane. And um, it's clearly not. And you, these guys keep me straight. And I thank you for that. Um, so with that, Member Jordan. Yeah, I, I certainly want to respond. I was looking at the numbers on <laughs> your evaluation. And there was one person that stood out that had different scores than most people. And that was me. And just to explain it, uh, I just don't believe that uh, anyone is perfect. There's always room for improvement for sure. But as city managers go, I will tell you that um, you're a class act for sure. And what embarrasses me more is that we have to, because we've all had this conversation about how do we handle this one citizen who's always so negative towards our city manager. And it, I have to grit my teeth because I really want to say something um, against this person who is just negative all the time. And, you know, as they say, you only miss your water when the wells runs dry. And um, we could end up with someone else. I mean, Scott is, is retired from the military. He could decide one day he doesn't want to do this anymore. And you have to go through the process of finding somebody, and you won't find another Scott Lurice, I, I will tell you. I've had a lot of CEOs that I have had to uh, evaluate, and I would tell you that Scott is up at the top as far as his character and um, his attitude, yeah. uh, his positive attitude, every time I talk to him, he's always positive and happy to be at work. So it is very much appreciated. I know by all of us that we have you as the city manager, and we hope that your uh, stay here is very long, even after we're gone, because that's one of the things about, um, you know, politicians, if you will, elected officials. We're only here temporarily, 
but the standard bearer is the CEO, the city attorney, and staff. And so uh, our staff is really good, and they're really good because they respect the leader that uh, we have in place, and uh, I certainly respect you. So thank you. And just to conclude, because it goes right in here, is that I always used to tell the biggest, tell my coaches the biggest compliment I could give them is, I need you back. I, I, I can't let you go. I can't have you going over to this school. I, I need you here. And I've said that to the city manager more than he wants to hear it. Although I must say I'm a little more selfish than maybe member Jordan just noted. I said, you got to stay here at least three years. <laughs> and and uh, then we can talk, but you you got to stay here for three years. So with that, Member Robinson. Yes, uh, uh, just to uh, Member uh, Jordan, as um, we used to do what we call fitness reports in the military, there is uh, there is no perfect person, but there is perfect performance. Amen. I like that. You need to think about that, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that's everybody on the council. Uh, city manager. Yes, sir. J just to uh, thank, uh, I enjoy serving, um, and I will continue to serve beyond three years. Don't worry about that. Um, but, I, again, I, I can't do what I do without the tremendous staff that I have. And they're, they're a great team. Uh, they've pulled together as a team through some pretty trying times, um, trying to bring a, a new uh, software system on board, a complete mainframe during a global pandemic. Uh, it's amazing. Um, they always respond. Um, I, I speak to these guys most every night. <laughs> so uh, it, when I don't have a phone call, I wonder if I've missed the phone call. So. Um, it's a real pleasure to serve, and don't you worry about me going anywhere. Uh, with that, I do have uh, two action items. Um, it's traditional that we cancel the uh, December 28th, which is the second meeting in December. We have two meetings scheduled, the 5.30 presentation meeting and the 6.30 presentation meeting. Uh, requ we request council vote, whether or not vote to council both of these meetings. Um, I don't think I need to say a lot. Do I have a motion? So moved, sir. I have a motion from Member Jordan, a second from Vice Mayor. All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Carries. Hold on a second. He didn't hear what the motion was. We're going to not have a meeting on December 20, 28th. 28th in December. We always we yes, take sir. that Christmas day off. Say yes. Makes it unanimous. I'll, 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 okay. I'll be here. It's unanimous. I, I know where you're traveling to. Um, the second action item is the nomination to the Bicycle Pedestrian Technical Advisory Committee. We'd like to send, nominate our planner, uh, Naviel Fontes, to uh, that committee, which is part of the Space Coast TPO's uh, Technical Committee. Can I get a motion? Move for approval. Scott, I, have an I got a motion from Member Jordan and a second from Member Robinson. I have an alternate, right. too, that they were asking to be appointed. Okay. I missed that. Yeah, I miss that. And Rachel Mahler is the alternate. She's our environmental um, uh, planner, so she would be the alternate. Um, Can that, that be, part, be part of the, part of the motion. same motion? Yes, sir. Member Jordan, motion. Yes. Uh, Member Robinson, seconds. Holds. Sure. Okay, I have a, a motion and a second. Let's go. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? Cat passes unanimously. Thanks, Wanda. Good catch. Uh, the last item that I have is. Um, we have we didn't do the tree lighting ceremony last year because of covid uh we've reached out and i'm not sure we're going to be able to get the children that come to sing at a proposed date to do the christmas tree lighting ceremony um staff's recommending the, you know if council wants us to go forward we'll we'll plan it but we're not sure how well the attendance would be without that particular portion of it so um we can ceremonially light the, the tree to have pictures if, if you guys want to do that, or just wake up one morning and the tree will be lit. I think, <laughs> I, I think uh, having discussed this, um, perhaps we hold it off one more year, but I will say that if you really look at it, when we do have that tree lighting, the sculptor kids come and say, I love the, the event, don't misunderstand me. The only really people you have there are the parents of the sculptor kids. So it's really not a city event at this point. There was a time, 
and I can't remember how far back we have to go, but it seems like we were just getting on council that it went with a street party, you know, that winter wonderland street party. And if we get back to having a street party, then I think it would be a good time to light the tree and the city would be involved, citizens would be involved. But at this point, I don't really think that that's the case. And I think if nothing else, it might be a good wait and see one last um, COVID-ish hold up. But uh, that's where I would be. I and, and I do think Parrish is having their traditional tree lighting ceremony. And that really, is, as, as is quite the honestly, city, city manager noted, um, I think I can certainly repeat this for you, that that really has become the lighting of the tree in the city of Titusville. That is really the city comes together from all parts. You have that. You have the fireworks. You have the singers. You have the people that bring over from Orlando, Elf, et cetera. Yeah, I look forward to that event a lot. And there's a lot of people there. So I think that we can certainly look at that again for one more year. I'm not sure everybody else feels. Everybody All right. Well, then would we want to vote on that, or is he just going? No, I, 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 I've got consensus, but we'll, we will light the tree, and we yeah, will we will do a press release, and we'll do the things that we normally would do. It just won't be an attended. And event. there's going to be plenty of things still to do. This isn't like you know we're coming back quite definitely. Uh, I would question just how much the city's involved in that lighting anyway. In the last the last few times I've been there, very good. That's it. And, uh, city attorney. City attorney has one. Yes, sir. I have two items and I have two handouts. Oh, great. Handout. You realize that it's 14 minutes past member Jordan's bedtime? I actually was a lot longer than that. I'm telling you, 15 minutes from now, I was out last night. Hopefully, this will not reflect poorly on my evaluation. Um, <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got another one. Okay. Yes, sir. The first item, which is in your agenda package, was we received the uh, formal notice regarding the National Opioid Settlement. We've talked about this previously. Uh, the state of Florida, in negotiating with the Attorney General's office in, in, with regard to the opioid settlement, each subdivision, city and counties within the state, must decide whether to participate in the opioid settlement. If the city does not participate, it cannot directly share in any of the settlement funds. The first step is to register on the National Settlement website to receive the documentation that the city will need to participate. Next, the city, once we receive the documentation, must execute and submit all required documents on the state's website. So part of this is we need to register, and at the time of registering, we need to identify the individual authorized to sign formal documents binding the city. So I'd like council so a direction on that individual uh, be it the city manager or the mayor as the formal as the person to sign formal documents uh, first thing I would say in discussion I was the first one to say that I would say city manager mostly because he's here every day eight hours a day and if that needs to be signed I don't have to meaning they don't have to call me and say hey come in and sign this it just makes sense to me yeah. so I'm, I'm good with that um, anything else we need to do with that I know that was part so, of it so to be clear, the authorization is we'll register and have the city manager designate as individual to sign documents. Is that just an advisement not ahead, or we need to give you a vote on that? As long as the okay. minutes reflect, there's consensus on All that. right, city manager works for me. Okay. Now was the first item I handed out was a copy of the formal notice. There's website information if you'd like to go and, and, and answer a lot of the questions you may have. Uh, the second item, and the reason this wasn't in the agenda is because I just received this. Uh, and I'm providing you a copy of a letter that my office received from a Finney law firm. Uh, a copy is attached in which they allege that the city's land development regulations pertaining to allowable uses within the Indian River City Neighborhood Commercial Subdistrict violates the Americans with Disability Act, the Rehabilitation Act, stating that our code, in their opinion, denies patients suffering from mental impairments of substance abuse and addiction from accessing treatment within that IRC commercial subdistrict <clears throat> while permitting patients suffering from physical impairments access to treatment in the same area. So I want to let you know we are looking at that uh, together with staff to evaluate this com com uh, complaint and provide analysis and recommendations to you in the future. And as you recall earlier tonight, you gave advisability to look at certain sections of the code and come back to you um, in that regard. So what are you needing from us? 
this is for information. Okay, just an I'm FYI. I'm advising you that we received this letter with this complaint and that we are looking at that and we will be coming back to you. Is there anything we need to do as a council to clarify and move forward to remedy this situation? You gave us advisability and we're going to come back to you with some recommended code languages in that regard. Okay, there we go. There you go. Is that it? Yes, sir. Council, anything? I was giving you one last shot. With that, meeting adjourned.